Hey HK fans, James here with another H&K weapon review for you. And today I'm pretty excited because we're going to be covering my favorite pistol line from uh, Eckler & Koch. That's the P7 series. Uh, now it wasn't their first and it certainly hasn't been their last, but for myself and for a lot of other enthusiasts, the P7 series really is the gold standard from a company that's well known for uh, producing some pretty incredible uh, pistols. Now, for me personally, growing up in the 80s and the early 90s, uh, the P7 series was just this cool, iconic handgun that when you saw it in film, it was almost always in the hands of the bad guys. Uh, so whether that was uh, Beverly Hills Cop 2 or Under Siege, uh, Armageddon, uh, or everybody's favorite Christmas movie, Die Hard, uh, in the hands of... Uh, Hans Gruber with the P7M13, it was almost like it was evil by design. And uh, getting to handle one and shoot one for the first time myself, it was all over. Um, it's been, uh, it's been a, a very uh, expensive habit since then. Um, but for this video specifically, as in all the videos that have preceded it, my goal is to produce um, really the definitive a resource uh, for these weapons. Um, I think what you see all too often if you scroll through YouTube is a lot of uh, videos that are heavy on flash and bang and very light on actual relevant and accurate uh, content. Um, so for this, this will be a comprehensive review on the P7 series from history, design, um, specific models, uh, benefits and features, pros and cons, all from in you know, my experience as an armor operator instructor um, on these weapons and, and what I see with them every day. Um, so uh, I will warn you though that this is not going to be brief. Uh, this, this will be the most comprehensive um, review on these weapons that you're going to find. And um, if you thought you knew a lot about P7 series, well, get ready because you're going to learn a whole lot more. Uh, I even learned quite a bit. Um, putting all this together. So this has been fun for me as well. And if you're not already an owner of a P7 series pistol, by the end, you're probably going to want to be. Um, so with all that said, why don't you guys grab yourself a nice tasty beverage, find yourself somewhere comfortable to sit, and we'll jump right in. Now to begin, we have to go back and look at where H&K was at the time and what external factors in the world were at work. Uh, by the early 1970s, the company was firmly established as a leading firearms manufacturer in Europe, and their G3 rifle was in service with the German military, and export contracts were being filled as well. Uh, its design had been successfully adapted for the 5.56 millimeter and 9 millimeter cartridges and developed into the HK33 series and MP5 series, and their first pistols, the HK4, P9 series, uh, and VP70 had proved that the company could compete in the handgun market as well. Now in Germany during the 1960s, the need for a new police service pistol was widely being discussed. And as a result of the post-war era, uh, the majority of police officers at the time were carrying former World War II er issue pistols like the Walther PP, PPK, and P38. A survey taken in 1971 across German police forces had reported back that 82% of policemen uh, would rather have a 9mm semi-auto pistol or a large caliber revolver over the 7.65mm pistols in majority of service at the time. As a result, a select group of police experts formed a working group to frame a concept for a new police issue handgun. Uh, this working group was strongly influenced by the results of the Munich massacre, uh, the Olympics in uh, September 1972, and one of the primary outcomes of which was a general lack of necessary weapons, including handguns, in order to meet this new global terrorism threat. And the result of that working group from uh, June 19th, 1975, was uh, the statement of work for handheld small arms, table of design, and function features of handheld small arms for police service. That's a mouthful. Uh, this later... Uh, this document was later refined into the final version presented on March 1st, 1976, entitled Test Criteria for Classification of Handheld Small Arms. And then these two documents became the basis for design and introduction of a new and improved police handgun, 
which German small arms manufacturers and designers work swiftly to meet this new requirement with. At uh, H&K, the P9 and P9S had already been designed, but did not meet all the requirements set forth in the statement of work. Therefore, their lead desire, designer, uh, Helmut Velde, uh, presented a completely new concept for a self-loading pistol. And this is where I'm most impressed with uh, the way H&K approaches weapons programs, uh, whether it's uh, other companies were simply attempting to modify current weapons to fit the requirements of this program, uh, H&K had flipped the clean sheet of paper on the drawing board and started fresh. Um, reviewing those requirements and findings of the survey and the studies, um, the design team um, found several critical items. Uh, first, uh, they found that most police shootings are over in just a matter of seconds. Uh, second, that most often less than five rounds were being fired. And then third, the person who could draw and bring the weapon into action the fastest and then shoot the most accurately would win the gunfight. So armed with that information, they began with the intent to design a pistol to be the fastest weapons to draw and bring into action, or what would later be termed the continuous motion action. Um, and he chose to do so in an unconventional way um, at the time, and really still today as far as firearms um, are designed. Um, the two basic and design features which distinguish uh, this from other conventional pistols were the necessary locking in the cycle of operations being accomplished by expanding propellant gases of the round being fired and the cocking in the cycle of operations being accomplished by the use of a grip actuated cocking lever against the firing pin. Um, I'll talk about these innovations more uh, later in the video, uh, but to continue, uh, these were first put into practice initially uh, for functional testing on two HK4 pistols. Uh, shown here, you see the first test model was serial number 9999, which incorporated a rear-mounted cocking lever, uh, which is somewhat reminiscent of what looks like a 1911 grip safety. Um, that soon evolved into using a front-mounted cocking lever, shown here on uh, serial VM058. Uh, both of these pistols still utilize the HK's four uh, original simple blowback design, uh, just proving the cocking lever concept. Uh, to begin work on the expanding propellant gas locking theory, uh, further development was done on a VP-70 pistol. Uh, shown here, uh, serial number 2231 uh, used a gas pressure brake, which provided a delayed opening of the slide for unlocking cycle of operation. I'll touch on this more um, as we get into the function later. The first new model development efforts began in January 1976. Uh, the first prototype, serial number 001, shown here, was manufactured in May of, of that year. Um, at the end of that month, it was presented to the director of the Border Guard School in Lubeck, uh, which was the organization chosen to conduct the trials. Initially offered as a self-loading pistol because it was entered into the new police service pistol trials, uh, the latest pistol design from Heckler & Koch was given its preliminary name, Police Self-Loading Pistol, or PSP. Uh, the lack of the name is evident here on serial number 002 as well, um, but with serial number 003 um, was commemorated by having PSP added to the left side of the slide in large letters. Uh, interestingly, though, uh, for serial numbers 004 through 007, as you see here, um, were produced without the PSP designation on the left side of the slide, uh, just a serial number on the right side of the slide receiver for those guns. Uh, you will also note that these pistols um, have a unique uh, grip design that changed from a smooth grip to a vertical sh uh, diamond shaped pattern. By July uh, 25th, 1976, all competitive pistols had been delivered to the border uh, guard school and the test trials began. Uh, pistols to compete were provided by the following companies, uh, Walther, Sig Sauer, uh, Mauser, which uh, later withdrew their effort, Astra, and Heckler & Koch. Uh, the first two PSPs undergoing the trial were serial numbers 002 and 004, and then serial numbers 13, 15, and 16, and then finally 18, 19, and 20. Uh, the trials ran for almost two years, uh, concluding in March of 1978. Uh, 
Uh, during that period, the PSPs outperformed all other submissions. Uh, serial number 18 and 19 uh, passed endurance testing of 5,350 and 5,015 rounds, respectively, uh, without issue. And serial number 15 and 16 showed remarkable records of 13,000 and 11,000 rounds, respectively, and were also put through atmospheric influence testing. Uh, serial number 20 passed the harsh drop uh, tests after a provisional 6,500 round endurance firing and then a final uh, test of 6,900 rounds. Uh, the PSPs have passed all the tests and received the safety release by the Technical Commission of the Police. And having been the seventh pistol tested by the Border Guard School, the PSP was given its designation name P7. Uh, what's kind of unusual for uh, this program um, of procurement was um, we're more interested, or I'm sorry, more used to a contract being met by one specific product and that one being selected and all the other ones kind of fall away at that point. Um, but for these, all the weapons that were submitted, um, which had passed the test, received acceptance um, and were available for adoption for German security forces. Uh, so depending on the specific needs of, of that, that state or that specific unit, they could pick any one of these, uh, these weapons. And those weapons that were tested and selected were um, the P1 by Walther, which was just a modified P38 in 9mm, uh, the P2, which was a 6-hour P210-4, the P3 was the Astra 600, uh, the P4 um, was also from Walther. It was a, a shortened barrel P38 with a, uh, a removal of a safety, just a, uh, a decocker uh, function on it. Uh, and then we had uh, a P5 from Walther, which was um, an updated P38 design where instead of the barrel being exposed on the end, it was captured under the slide. And then the P6 uh, from 6 Hour, which was a P225 compact 9mm single stack variant. Uh, after the Lubecker test trials, additional pistols were manufactured to test the pistols in daily use of different police units. Uh, these pistols were also manufactured in HMK's uh, design workshop by hand. Uh, they were in some detail, uh, mainly internally, different from those uh, produced in later serial production. Uh, these test weapons, like serial number 003, um, are designated by the markings PSP on the left side of the slide and run the serial number range up to 239. Uh, throughout this video, I'll be showcasing several incredibly uh, rare P7 series pistols from a friend's collection, uh, and here's the first. Uh, shown here is serial number 031. It's one of the first to come off of, uh, come out after the trials. And you'll notice the serial numbers on the slide and receiver and the HH or 1977 date code on the trigger guard. Uh, a small portion of these pistols have a red H and K logo um, with the rest of the markings being white. And those pistols were used for photography purposes, showing more of a contrast in the pictures. Uh, early PSPs have a diamond shaped upper uh, surface of the slide, whereas later ones have uh, longitudinal groovings um, as we've seen on the remainder of the P7 series productions to come, and, and that was to help take down the glare um, when you're looking down the sights of the pistol. As seen here with serial number 41, uh, which also has a nice set of wood grips, uh, many of the first examples also have tritium dots in the front and rear sights, while later produced PSPs only have white dots. Uh, the cocking levers were made with a uh, finger rest for better grip, um, but tests were conducted both with smooth grip and very rough. Um, and as you can see here, if you look closely, um, the cocking lever on serial number 191, you can see these longitudinal grooves um, on the four sides um, in order to find that, those best solutions. Okay. The first PFC, I'm sorry, PSPs already featured um, an internal slide stop, um, but the slide had to actually be pulled back for disengagement. Um, if you look closely at the front of the grip on this early PSP, you'll notice the lack of an external um, slide stop. Uh, if you're not sure what I'm referring to, don't worry, I'll cover that shortly. 
Um, a later design change of the slide stop lever uh, made it possible to release the slide by depressing the cocking lever. As such, nearly all of the uh, first PSPs were returned back to the factory for this upgrade. Um, but as you can see with another group um, photo of, of uh, serial number 191 here from the left side, it, it's got that upgrade. Okay, so the P7. As I discussed in my P9 series video review, uh, the final plan model uh, from that line, the P9K, was to begin with the 500,000 serial number range. Um, but at the same time, a decision was made to use that range for the P7 production as well. Uh, since the P9K was not to continue into full-scale production and the PSP production ended with serial number 239, it was decided that P7 uh, serial production would begin with serial 500-251. Uh, this leaves a gap of weapons from serial number 240 to 250 that you may be wondering about. Uh, this small batch was actually the first of the P7s, uh, which were kept in H&K for internal testing. Um, here you can see number 246, which has made it into private hands. Uh, don't be confused by the IF date code, though. Um, that just reflects when the weapon was proofed uh, before being offered for sale. So, it was on January 5th, 1979 that the first P7 shipped, uh, followed by uh, serial numbers 500-252 and uh, 051 and 061. Uh, these first 13 um, serial production pistols um, as, uh, were all built by hand. The next lot, uh, which comprised of the remaining 250 weapons ending with serial number 500, um, and here you can see a very uh, early transitional model from this production lot. This is serial number 477 which has unique grips uh, with the left side marked HKPSP. I haven't seen that anywhere else, which is pretty cool. Um, starting with serial number 501, all the pistols were produced on computer numeric control or CNC milling machines. And as you can see in this photo, production was done uh, three at a time, uh, either with slides or receivers. Okay, so unlike the P9 series that preceded it, uh, which you can see here, used uh, stamp steel construction. Okay, so I've got a uh, stamped and rolled uh, slide uh, that's then just been welded together and a series of uh, rolls and welds on this receiver here on a P7. Um, that's, I'm sorry, P9, that's significantly different from how the P7 series was designed. Whereas the P7 series, uh, you have a solid block of metal uh, that is milled into a receiver. And then again, an example here of a solid block of metal that is milled out to create what will become the slide. Um, and once, the, uh, once that slide's been, uh, been milled, then they weld in this section here that's got the firing pin uh, channel and the breech face and the area for the, uh, for the drop safety. Um, all that's done at the end. Uh, differences from the original PSP? Well, first we have the markings. Um, the first PSPs have an italic caliber marking. Um, uh, on the left side, and all, all the others have standard markings. Also gone is the PSP marking on the slide. Um, second, uh, several parts internally um, have a slightly different shape uh, and are stamped. And then third, the plastic uh, grips have uh, small raised edges towards the side of the slide, uh, which are guided into the uh, recesses of the slide. And that helps prevent the, uh, the grips from coming off uh, when, the, when the weapon's all assembled like that. Uh, P7 of the early production had plastic grips ending at the bottom of the grip. Uh, later, those uh, were covering the magazine, and the diamond checkering pattern was replaced by this random uh, stippled design that you can see here. 
Uh, and then fourth, uh, the slide of the P7 is uh, slightly wider at the muzzle to give the uh, pistol a little more nose heaviness. Okay. There were a few uh, experimental P7s in caliber 22 LR um, with uh, a VM prefix. These included serial numbers uh, 33, uh, 37 through 41, 50, and 53, as well as one test pistol without a serial number. Uh, these were produced at the request of uh, the German uh, Bavarian police. Um, of all the German organizations that adopted the P7, um, uh, Bavaria proved to be the longest user, and uh, this is a beautiful example of one such uh, pistol. Uh, soon into service, though, the Bavarian police uh, requested an updated magazine release, which helped uh, prevent uh, snagging. As you can see here, uh, the original design protruded downward uh, from the rear of the magazine well. Uh, <clears throat> the updated design was somewhat complex in nature uh, and a rotating design uh, that requires you to actually push it in and then up. And I've got an example of that right here. Um, as you can see here, it's actually spring-loaded, um, so you would push it in and up, and it would rotate and allow the, uh, the magazine to come loose. Um, so this was the original design. You can denote it by the circle there at the, at the center of it. Uh, that was later simplified uh, to just one single block of metal to what you see now in what we call the flush release, which just rotates under a single spring tension. Uh, to release the magazine. As Germany is uh, subdivided into uh, several individual states, some states chose one pistol over another from the uh, Lubecker test trial uh, to arm their police force, and that was usually done um, due to the lower cost of those pistols over the P7. It was clearly the most expensive of the bunch. Uh, those that did choose the P7 as their standard sidearm included Bavaria, Lower Saxony, uh, Baden-Württemberg, as well as the GSG-9, the Special Counter-Terrorist Unit for, uh, for Germany. Now, before we go any further, let's transition here into providing a deep dive into the design of the weapon itself. Um, H&K had offered special cutaway ver versions for use and explain the operations, unfortunately. I don't have those here, um, so um, they continue to elude my collection, maybe one day. We'll get one of those unicorns, uh, but I'll accomplish this task here using uh, a few of the models I got here on the desk. Uh, the P7 was designed as a 9mm self-loading gas-retarded semi-automatic handgun with a magazine capacity of 8 rounds. Uh, the most unusual feature is that it has a squeeze cocking device instead of a traditional single action or double action mode of firing. When we say squeeze cocking device, we're referring to this portion right here on the front of the grip. You actually squeeze here when you grip the pistol, and that's what cocks the weapon and brings it into action. <clears throat> it's uh, integrated into the front grip, um, and it's automatically encircled when the shooter's fingers uh, grip the pistol and he holds it in his hand. Um, as the shooter grips the pistol, uh, those fingers depress the squeeze cocker, which automatically cocks the firing pin, or what we often call the striker. So you can see, actually, when you cock the pistol, the firing pin extends out of the rear of the pistol. And when I release the uh, cocking lever, it goes back inside the pistol and remains safe again. Uh, this motion of actually gripping the cocking lever requires about 12 pounds of pressure. Uh, but once that is overcome, it only requires about a pound to hold it in place. Okay. As previously discussed, uh, H&K had initially tested the squeeze cocking um, functionality on an HK4 as a prototype, um, but with the cocking lever first at the uh, rear and then somewhat similar to that 1911 grip safety, then they moved it to the front. Uh, the incorporation of this cocking lever was to achieve the goal of the study to be able to bring the weapon into action as rapidly and as safely as possible, and then to render it uh, um, safe again just as rapidly. Okay, so unlike the other pistols of the, of the time, there was no um, external safety that you would have to manipulate before you could actually um, fire the weapon and then uh, have to defeat a very heavy uh, double action trigger pull and then transition into single action and then 
again, manipulating uh, a safety at the end uh, with the P7 series, uh, just simply gripping the pistol, brought it into action and you can immediately fire uh, consistent single action like trigger pull all the way through and again, releasing your grip made it safe again uh, immediately. Um, because that depressing the cocking lever also cocks the firing pin uh, into position, all that's needed for that single action like trigger is to pull the trigger. Uh, there's just no, uh, no double action trigger pull first and then transition single. It's the same consistent pull um, all the way through, which is another great advantage. Um, so with the grips removed on this P7, you can see that the cocking lever here um, and then beneath it is called the drag lever. And we can see part of the drag lever here. The rest of it is actually under the cocking lever at this point. Uh, both of these parts uh, pivot on this axle here at the base of the, uh, of the receiver. And they're operated against the spring tension of a two-pronged spring that's mounted here underneath the, uh, the cocking lever and drag lever with one of those legs of the spring on the cocking lever and the other leg on the drag lever. Within the receiver itself is what's called a catch. Okay, and if I pull the cocking lever back here, you just barely see the front of it right here, the silver portion there. And it's actually a stepped piece. Um, so it's the catch that holds the cocking lever in place under the pressure from the grip and reduces the overall force that's required for the shooter to hold the cocking lever back when it's gripped. And that small ledge on the catch um, completes this action. And uh, when the cocking lever slips off the grip, uh, then it's allowed to, to fall forward again. Now connected to the drag lever, here is the sear bar. And it starts here and extends all the way back to the back. Okay, and it pivots by way of the sear spring, which is this L-shaped spring mounted to the drag lever. And with its curved tip, you can see here on the top of the sear bar, is this angle that sticks in, um, it actually pulls the firing pin, uh, which is sometimes referred to as a striker, but I'm gonna call it a firing pin through the remainder of the video. It pulls the firing pin back to the rear uh, when, this, then, when the cocking lever is depressed, making the weapon ready to fire. Now, as you'll see here with the firing pin assembly removed from the back of the slide, I can take the firing pin bushing off and now you'll see this, this triangular pole on the right side of the firing pin. That's what actually interfaces um, with the sear bar. And it sits inside the pistol like so. And as you grip the cocking lever and depress it back to the rear, the sear bar is forced back and that then makes contact with the pole on the firing pin and now pulls the firing pin back uh, where you'll see it exposed out the rear of the slide, and now the weapon's ready to fire. Okay. Now let's look at the trigger. Okay. Uh, the trigger is uh, connected to what we call the transmission bar, which is underneath the sear bar. It's this piece that starts right here and extends all the way down to here. Okay. Um, when the pistol is at rest, the cocking lever is uh, is released, if you pull the trigger, you'll see that the trigger and the transmission lever will move, but no other action is taken. Okay, it's completely out of contact with everything else. So you could have a completely loaded weapon right now and pull the trigger all day long and it's never gonna fire. Okay, but when the cocking lever is depressed, um, now you'll see again, it pulls uh, the drag lever, pulls the sear bar to the rear, now, if I actuate the trigger, you'll notice that the transmission le lever will move and it will pull the front of the sear bar forward and that will pivot the back of the sear bar down, um, causing the sear bar to move out of its position where it's holding the firing pin back to the rear and that allows the firing pin to move forward and strike that um, cartridge that's in the chamber. So. When it's at rest, you can pull the trigger all day long. The transmission lever is not in contact with the sear bar, but when the cocking lever is depressed, now pulling the trigger activates the transmission lever to pull forward and up on the front of the sear bar, which pivots the back of it down and allows the firing pin to move forward. Okay. 
then when the cycle uh, of the slide happens to the rear, uh, the sear bar catches the firing pin again, uh, pulling it um, for the next uh, shot, uh, which will require a sub subsequent trigger pull um, to release. And then when the shooter is done shooting, he simply releases the cocking lever, uh, which will once again release the striker or firing pin forward uh, safely. We'll take a look at how this is done uh, via dr uh, drop safety uh, later in the video. Okay. Though we would expect a P7 series pistol to uh, be fired as previously described um, by depressing the cocking lever and then pulling the trigger, it can actually been, be fired in two other ways. Uh, you can pull the trigger first and then depress the cocking lever and that will cause the weapon to fire. You can pull the trigger and depress the cocking lever at the same time and that'll uh, allow it to fire as well. I don't know why you would want to do either one of those, um, but um, it works just the same. Uh, another key feature of the pistol uh, to which the cocking lever is the first element was to make the pistol as smooth and snag-free as possible. And that meant removing uh, any unnecessary switches or levers. So as mentioned before, the cocking lever uh, omits the need for an external safety lever um, and I've already covered that it's got a, a heel mag release that's you know, kind of protected um, there at the bottom. In that same focus of streamlining the design and omitting unnecessary items, uh, you'll also notice that there is no external uh, slide release like you'd see in other guns. So for example, on a USP, I've got this gigantic chunky slide release sticking off of the side. Um, you're not gonna see that on the P7 series. It's nice and, and smooth on, 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 the, uh, on the side. Okay, so from a design standpoint, engineers uh, looked at that item as actually having two distinctly separate functions. Okay, for a slide release, uh, that was clearly a requirement of a tactical nature, needing to be able to release the slide as part of the loading um, and possible immediate reloading of the pistol in a gunfight. Uh, they did this by incorporating the slide release function into the cocking lever, okay? So what that means is that simply depressing the cocking lever um, then would draw the firing pin back into position to make the weapon ready to fire, um, but it also releases the slide when the slides um, lock back to the rear, which is a, a pretty cool function. Um, but for a slide stop function, uh, this was viewed as more of an administrative function. Um, of course, they wanted the slide to be held back to the rear when the last round was fired. In fact, that was a requirement of uh, the trials, um, which is really done by uh, the magazine uh, itself being loaded and the follower under spring tension pushing up, and it actually makes contact. You can see this point right here um, with uh, a detent that sticks out on the inside of the pistol. And that detent is, uh, is impacted by the follower. Uh, under spring tension pushes that up. And now the back end of the slide release, slide stop, would be up and in the way, preventing the uh, slide from moving forward. It actually sits in front of where the breech face is. Uh, so that's gonna happen automatically. Um, but they did not see the action of a manually operated slide stop um, to be something that you would do in the middle of a gunfight. Instead, that was for after the gunfight was over. Uh, for example, if you're checking your weapon to make sure it was unloaded properly, you're turning in, into, an or, uh, into the armory. Um, so let me explain how this works. And I'll do that here with the, uh, the left side of this pistol with the grips removed, okay? So the first thing you're going to see is what you know, is referred to as a slide stop or slide release, and that's this bar right here, okay? So it starts here, extends up at, at its pivot point um, up to the rear, okay? And it's under, uh, it pivots on this piece here that's kind of star-shaped. Um, it looks like half of a star, and we call this the rocker. And it's under spring tension of this dog leg spring that fits right underneath the slide stop slide release, okay? Um, so serving as a slide stop, you will notice that when I put in an empty magazine,
and I have to put in the right magazine. Okay, you'll see how the magazine follower here is going to push up on the slide stop and block it in position, as I mentioned previously. Okay. Now, um, with the weapon assembled, you can also see that if you want to engage the slide stop and slide release for administrative action, uh, when the slide is forward, I simply press in on the front of the slide stop slide release where it protrudes through the small section in the grips. So I look where the grips are and I see this one little area right here. That's the manually operated portion of the slide stop. You know, on this model, you can see it very clearly right here, um, but the rest of it's hidden underneath the grips. So if I want to manipulate this, I simply press in with my thumb as I pull the slide back to the rear, and now that's going to lock the slide in position. The same function as if I pushed here, and you can see how it pivots up and will block the slide from moving forward. Okay. It's a rather insignificant area on the pistol, and it's often overlooked or even noticed by owners. Um, I've actually seen more than one professional firearms expert present a review on these pistols and specifically state that there is no external slide stop capability um, on the pistols, but we've just determined that that um, is, uh, is otherwise. Um, as, as far as a slide release function, uh, looking again at this example with the grips removed, you'll notice the, uh, the tab coming off the drag lever. Okay, so here's the cocking lever here. And then underneath the cocking lever, you see this tab that sticks up right here, kind of like a tooth. That's part of the drag lever, okay? Um, and it sits uh, just beneath that cocking lever. Okay, so when the cocking lever is depressed, that tab actuates that bottom arm of the rocker, as you see here, and it's gonna pivot it up, okay? And when it pivots that edge of it back, the front edge of this rocker, will then make contact with this portion of the slide release and that will force it down. So if it was up right now, blocking that, rotating it here, the rocker is now going to push it down out of place and allow the slide to go forward and snap back into battery. Okay, so now let's look at a, uh, a USP pistol as an example. Um, so. Um, it's a unique function of releasing the slide with the cocking lever uh, during the grip process that eliminates one crucial step in the reloading process that shooters with other handguns will have to accomplish by either using a strong side release. So if the slide is locked back on a traditional handgun, I'd either use my uh, strong side hand to release the slide forward, or I could come across with my support hand and use that thumb to release it forward, or I could come over the top and do a slingshot method to release the slide forward. But with a P7 series, if the slide's back to the rear, all I have to do once I put a new mag in is re-grip the pistol, and that's going to release uh, the slide forward. So I don't have to then take another step of hitting an external slide release with one of my thumbs or coming over the top. I can immediately um, get right back to shooting. Uh, so someone who um, is a fan of uh, being as efficient as possible and eliminating us unnecessary steps, especially when you think about uh, fine motor skills being degraded in a, in a stressful situation, I really find that to be a great advantage of the P7 series um, you know, over a lot of other handguns um, that we see today. Okay. Um, now, Let's talk about the most unique feature of the P7 series, which is its gas-retarded blowback operating system. Okay, well, H&K had used a simple or straight blowback operation with their first pistol, the HK4. And I've got a video review on that on my channel. You can go check out if you wanna learn more about this pistol. Uh, in a simple blowback operation, uh, the weight or the mass of a slide and the strength of the recoil spring within is what keeps the slide and battery long enough for a safe firing of the weapon to occur. Uh, too light and the chamber uh, could open early, uh, causing uh, case separation um, and a very uh, nasty result. Okay, in the P9 series, what they did 
which again, I have another great video on if you want to check that out. Um, P9 series, they um, utilize the same roller delay blowback operation so successful in the G3 and MP5. Um, in the roller delay blowback, uh, the use of a locking piece and a set of rollers uh, which rest inside the recess of the barrel um, provides temporary delay in the rearward movement of the slide until the bullet leaves the barrel and the gas pressure is equalized. Um, so you can see here with this example, here is your uh, locking piece, which is fixed to the, uh, the carrier, and here is your bolt, which moves along the locking piece, and when it goes into battery, um, those rollers protrude outside the, uh, the bolt and fit inside the recesses of the barrel and, and lock the weapon in place. And this, uh, this delay in recoil is what makes these weapons so soft recoiling um, and makes them safe to keep them in battery until those gas pressures equalize. But with the P7 series, designers wanted to make a pistol as compact as possible. And that meant that the roller delayed blowback operation would not fit. And uh, nine millimeter had already proven through multiple designs previously to be too powerful of a cartridge for a simple blowback unless the slide was in incredibly large, which again violated the maximum compactness that they were striving for. So gas retarded blowback was chosen. Uh, what this means is that the expanding gas of a fired round is directed uh, in order to create the delay necessary to prevent the slide from opening until those pressure levels have reached a safe level. So let's look at these examples uh, to show you how that works. Um, as you can see here, uh, looking at the front of this completely uh, disassembled receiver, uh, inside where the barrel is, is supposed to be mounted, you will notice, if I can get the angle right, there's a small port right here. I'm sticking this dental pick down in. And that port moves into this chamber, which you can see is also right below where the barrel is. That chamber is where a gas cylinder is going to be housed when the uh, pistol is fully assembled. Okay. Now, um, let's look at this barrel that I've got pulled from the weapon. And what you'll notice again, if I look inside the barrel, I don't know how well I'm going to be able to point this out to you, but there is, well, how about I just show you right here? There's a hole in the bottom of the barrel. And you can see where the dental pick sticks out here, right there at the front of the chamber. Okay, That is where the uh, gas port in the barrel fits in with the hole here in the top or of uh, in the bottom of the recess there that goes into that port. So those two things uh, link up together uh, once the barrel is properly assembled. Now at the front of the slide, uh, what you'll see is a gas piston. You notice these number of, of rings um, as we move along the gas piston. Okay, The piston, when the slide is in battery, uh, sits forward of this gas cylinder right here with the first ring inside and the second ring right up against the edge of it. So it'll look just like that uh, when they're all assembled. Okay. Now, when the weapon fires, um, the, uh, the bullet's gonna begin moving down the barrel and those gases are gonna move behind uh, that, uh, that bullet as it moves down the barrel. And part of those gases are going to be uh, siphoned down into that gas port. And they're gonna move down to the gas cylinder and they're gonna try and move forward, but they're gonna be blocked uh, by the gas piston, okay? And that, that block is what then locks the slide into position and prevents the slide from going into recoil until the bullet has left the barrel and those gas pressures can equalize. Once they can equalize, then that resistance is overcome and the gas piston moves within the, the uh, confines of the gas cylinder itself and the weapon will go into uh, to recoil. Now, even though this delay is very minimal, uh, it's enough to, uh, to create that safe action for firing, but it also aids in minimizing the felt recoil to the shooter. So what most people fail to realize is that with this 
gas retarded delay system is that it's unique um, as well against all the other current production pistols we see uh, relating to the eight step cycle of operations. And what I mean by that is that in almost all handguns, uh, that cycle begins with feeding, chambering, then locking, firing, unlocking, extraction, injection, and cocking. Uh, but with the P7 series and its uh, unique gas retarded delay system, that cycle changes to locking occurring after, after but not before firing. Um, in other words, the weapon is unlocked prior to firing. Once that firing occurs and the bullet's moving down the barrel, and the, when those gas pressures inside the gas cylinder are forced against the gas piston, that's when the locking occurs. Um, so pretty cool. Um, of course, the critics of the P7 uh, series will quickly uh, point out that its primary downside of the gas retarded piston operation system is the heat that's associated with the process. Okay, so obviously uh, you got this big um, uh, heat sump right here. And where is that? Well, it's right above where your trigger is. And in an all steel construction uh, pistol with your finger sitting right here, it gets pretty hot uh, pretty quick, okay? Um, it only takes a, you know, a few magazines to be firing in rapid succession for that to, uh, to get pretty uncomfortable for you. Um, but what I would tell those critics um, is that they're completely ignorant of the original study requirements from where this pistol um, was developed from, uh, which, again, it found that the gunfights that law enforcement officers were encountering rarely lasted more than exhausting a single magazine. Um, and that's why they designed the pistol around the ability to be the fastest and most accurate compact pistol to bring into action and win the fight. Um, so that's my retort. Uh, now, while we're looking at the operation of the pistol in the slide, let's take another look at the barrel. Um, what you will notice um, here uh, inside the chamber, if I can point them to you and get the right angle, you see these lines? All these longitudinal lines around the inside of the chamber, those are what we call barrel flutes. Okay, um, and these flutes aid in the extraction of a casing after firing. And this is a carryover from H&K's roller delayed weapons, uh, and here's how it works. So, with a standard, uh, you know, traditional type weapon like a like a USP, for example. Um, um, or any weapon that, that doesn't have the fluted barrel design, when that bullet is fired, all of those, the gas pressures that are moving back inside the barrel, they're gonna move inside that empty um, casing. Uh, and what that's gonna do is cause the walls of that casing to expand and press outward. Um, and that can obviously cause it to create a great amount of friction inside the chamber when we're now trying to extract and eject that chamber, uh, that cartridge out. And that's why in those types of designs, you'll see such massive uh, extractors needing to be required um, in order to um, grab hold of that casing and yank it out um, hard enough uh, during uh, those recoil forces. But with the fluted design, uh, what you have are those expanding gases moving back. And of course, some of them are gonna move inside the, the empty casing and press out but the rest of them are going to fill into those lines all around the barrel, and they're going to equalize that pressure around the outside of the casing, literally allowing the casing to float out of the chamber. And that's why on a P7 series pistol, you have a much smaller um, extractor um, because it's not as a greater requirement um, for extraction injection in these pistols because of the barrel design. Uh, than it is in uh, more traditional pistols, uh, which is uh, which is pretty uh, cool feature of that. Um, it's it's really just not a critical thing. And uh, my friend uh, Jim Schatz, who worked for H and K for years, would often perform weapons demonstrations for customers, where he would actually remove the extractor from the pistol in order to prove this fact, um, and, and it would always impress him. And I've done that several times when I've taught courses as well, and it always uh, really surprises students uh, in the process. Um, but having the extractor in place, why would you have it? Well, it just provides more consistent um, um, extraction uh, in a significant pattern, 
And what you'll see with these types of pistols, when you go to the range and you shoot, and then you go to pick up your brass at the end, you think it's going to be right there by your feet. It won't be. It'll be, it'll be several yards away. It really launches them um, out of there. Okay. But the heart of the P7 series, uh, series uh, like all the HK weapons, is the barrel itself. Um, if there's one thing that HK does well, um, it's make barrels, uh, the highest quality, long-lasting uh, barrels um, that we've seen really in production pistols. Um, for their pistol lines, uh, the barrels come in as blanks where they're then inspected and then they're deep drilled and uh, polygonal uh, mandrels are inserted into the barrels. Okay, and then four barrels at a time uh, are placed into one of their cold forging uh, hammer machines um, where four hammers uh, would take action imparting 140 tons of pressure uh, per beat and a, and a thousand beats per minute. Uh, and this will stretch the barrels to 154% of their original length. Uh, that total time of production was about four minutes. And when the barrels uh, were done, they would be heat treated to about 600 degrees for hardening and then chrome plated to prevent rust and reduce chamber uh, friction. A final inspection was then uh, completed uh, um, and made by uh, a, ma a machinist uh, visually with a barrel scope. Uh, it's a pretty cool process if you've ever been able to see a video of, uh, of how HK does that. Uh, like the previous uh, designs, HK chose to use polygonal rifling in the P7 series instead of the common lands and grooves. You know, if you can see how smooth the inside of the barrel is, um, really, really cool um, feature. Um, it has several advantages. Obviously, the first one's increased uh, service life of the barrel itself. Uh, the second one is increased muzzle velocity. Uh, since there are no grooves for which the expanding gases can travel into, uh, the gas pressures remain sealed behind that bullet as it moves down the barrel. Uh, this obviously increases the amount of energy acting upon the bullet, um, but it also prevents gas from overtaking the bullet as it leaves the barrel and adversely affecting the flight properties and the directional stability. Uh, lastly, um, as the polygonal prof profile has no sharp edges uh, inside, it virtually eliminates deposit of residue, making it significantly easier to clean and more resistant to, uh, to corrosion. And the fact that the uh, barrel is actually fixed to the slide uh, in combination with the gas retarded uh, recoil delay system, um, those all went directly into the engineer's goal of making the weapon as accurate as possible um, and faster with follow-up shots. Um, adding to that is uh, the last point, which is really a great advantage of the pistols, which is a low bore access. So once you put this in your hand, you can see how low it sits versus you know, more of a traditional double action, single action pistol. You can see how much higher the USP will sit in my hand because of the USP's uh, tilting barrel design and its recoil management, even though good, it's still going to recoil more up and back, whereas with the P7 series, the recoil is more straight back to the shooter. Uh, so it's very easy to control, um, and you get much faster and accurate follow-up shots with these pistols than, again, a standard um, conventional pistol. Okay, Rounding out the uh, design for the, uh, the P7 um, I can't forget to mention the optimal grip angle of 110 degrees, okay? So uh, much attention was paid to this by the engineers to make it as, as pointable as possible, the natural angle for someone to point their hand. Um, and this is obviously aged tremendously when you're under stress uh, for those first round accuracy shots. Um, when the other designers have attempted to try this, the result is usually having a magazine that is, has to be very angled as well, and then that creates uh, a, a very odd entry of the first round in the magazine to then have to make it into the chamber, requiring a, a pretty significant feed ramp and all kinds of issues with uh, reliable um, chambering of, of rounds, especially when you use hollow points or flat nose type of ammunition. Um, you don't have that problem uh, with the P7 series. So with the grips removed here, we can see the grip angle is very severe, um, but when I insert a magazine, you can see that the, that the magazine is almost completely straight up when it enters the pistol, even though there's a sharp angle on the pistol itself. And what that means 
is that the round that's in the top of the magazine is almost perfectly aligned to be horizontal and doesn't really require the necessity of a feed ramp at all. It just presses it right in. Uh, so that's a really cool feature uh, for reliable operation that the P7 series has that if you had the pistol fully assembled, you wouldn't think that. You'd look at this and say, wow, it must have a really steep angle on the magazine in order to make that work. How do they, how do, they do that reliably? Well, in reality, it actually fits in just like that. Um, so I've always thought that was pretty cool. Now, I can't forget to cover the uh, sights. As you'll see these um, here, they have a familiar uh, three-dot sighting system. Uh, now today the three dot system is the industry standard. Uh, it's hard to find a pistol that doesn't come standard with those. Uh, but most people have no idea that the P7 pistol is um, the one that really pioneered this sight design as a production pistol option. Um, so for the P7, uh, the sights uh, from factory are zeroed at 25 meters for point of aim, point of impact. Uh, with windage adjustments uh, you would drift the rear sight with a hammer and punch in the direction you want to move the strike of the round. Uh, so for example, uh, if you're shooting a grouping to the right and you want to move that grouping to the left to get it back to the center of the target, you drift the rear sight to the left. Uh, for elevation adjustments, the front sight is actually removed and then replaced with either a taller or shorter front sight. Uh, so as you can see here on the bottom of the sights, you'll find a number. Well, you'll see that, but it says 6.1, and that refers to 6.1 millimeter. Um, the standard height for a P7 uh, is 6.1 millimeters, and for the P7M series pistols, uh, which we'll cover shortly, uh, 6.8 millimeter was the standard height. Uh, replacement sights are in 0.2 millimeter increments, uh, with differences ranging from 5.7 millimeters um, to 6.9 millimeter on the P7 and uh, 6.4 millimeter to 7.6 millimeter on the P7 M series pistols. Uh, 1.2 millimeter change um, will affect the point of impact uh, by approximately two inches at 25 meters. So for a shorter front sight, that will raise the impact. And if you put in a taller front sight, that'll lower your impact. Now, let's talk about safety before we move on. Um, these principles are carried over across the entire um, P7 product line, uh, so it doesn't really matter which, which pistol I showcase it on. Um, they're all, uh, all the same uh, carryovers. Okay, so first you can see here uh, with the uh, grips and slide removed, uh, as we've already talked about, we had the trigger, okay? so. When it's at rest, um, without the, uh, the cocking lever engaged, the trigger is, is completely uh, separate uh, from the sear bar. Um, so that's your first level of safety. Uh, next, above the trigger, what you're going to see is the disconnector. Okay, let me point that out for you here. That's this piece right here. It's nested behind the trigger, behind the sear bar, uh, kind of above where the transmission bar is, okay? And when it's at, at rest, it's in its raised position, it's sitting up here in this little channel, okay? And where it also sits when the slide is on, is you'll notice this little scalloped out channel right here on the slide, okay? But you'll notice right outside of that channel, it immediately goes right back into this raised portion of the slide, okay? So, when the weapon's in battery, it's raised, no problem, the trigger can actuate all at, all at once. Um, but, if the slide is pulled back at any point further to the rear, now it's out of its channel, it's onto this longer uh, raised section here, and it's actually gonna force the disconnector down, okay? As I manipulate it here with my finger, you'll see what that does, is it pushes the transmission lever down when the disconnector goes down. Well, if the disconnector is down and it pushes the transmission lever down, then what happens is if I pull the trigger, now I can't actuate the sear bar again like I could before. So if I have the, the cocking lever gripped, I push the disconnector down, 
and now I pull the trigger, you'll see that it cannot actuate the sear bar to drop the sear bar. Okay, so what that disconnector does is it prevents out of battery fire, uh, meaning that the slide has to be fully in battery in order for the weapon to fire again. And that again will prevent um, that uh, case separation uh, and the very deadly uh, results that can happen with those types of things. Okay, the third thing we've got is that the firing pin actually has um, two different springs. And it's hard to see, obviously, with this assembled, um, but uh, outside of the actual firing pin spring, there's a uh, inertia spring that sits inside underneath it. And it's the combination of the resistance of both of those two springs that provide enough resistance to prevent the firing pin from striking uh, a chambered cartridge if the weapon was at rest and I just dropped it on the ground. Um, and most, uh, most handguns have some sort of uh, firing pin system in order to provide that same uh, uh, result. Uh, fourth, uh, the extractor serves as a dual role as a loaded chamber indicator. Um, so as you'll see here with uh, this P7M8, and I'll put a, a dummy round in the chamber. Okay, what you can see now is that the um, extractor now sticks out of the side of the slide, whereas on this unloaded P7 here, you'll notice it's flush. It's completely smooth. I don't notice it as well as I put my finger but now on the P7M8 with the loaded one. I can feel it. So it's a visual. I can look there and see it, but it's also a tactile feel at, at night to know that uh, it serves that dual role um, as a loaded chamber indicator. Uh, fifth, the firing pin. Uh, when the weapon is uh, is cocked, uh, that firing pin extends out the rear of the pistol. And uh, again, that serves as a visual and at night a tactile feel to let you know that the weapon is cocked at that point. Uh, sixth, uh, the force required to depress the cocking lever itself, um, as that is kind of an unfamiliar design, has served as a safety feature. Um, there's many documented cases throughout the 80s and 90s where a child um, had gotten their hands on a loaded P7 series, but thankfully it failed to discharge simply because they didn't, couldn't figure out or didn't have enough force uh, required to engage the cocking lever to, uh, to actually make the weapon fire. Uh, likewise, there were documented examples of officers armed with P7 series pistols that when struggling with sub subjects and they lost control of their pistol, um, those they were not shot because the assailants were not able to figure out how to properly uh, use the weapon because it was so unusual to them. Um, so that's kind of a, a neat feature. Um, and then finally, um, within the right rear of the slide, in a vertical channel right here, how well you guys are going to see that, there is a firing pin safety, a block um, or firing pin block or drop safety, whichever one you want to refer it to. Um, and this is a spring-loaded device um, that when it rests is at the top of that channel, okay, meaning it's sitting up here uh, when it's at rest. But when the cocking lever is depressed and that drag lever pulls the, uh, the firing pin back to the rear um, via the pole that's on the right side of the firing pin itself, as you can see here, um, at the same time, it engages that firing pin block um, and firing pin safety, and it brings it down. And now that is what is sitting in front of this pole, preventing it to move move forward. Okay, um, and it's it's being held there against its own spring tension, as long as uh, as long as that sear bar is pulled back to the rear. Now, only when the trigger is pulled and the transmission bar um, pivots on the front edge of the sear bar, dropping the rear of the sear bar. When the sear bar is now dropped out of position, it releases that firing pin block, that drop safety, and it flies back up to the top of the slide, and now the firing pin is, is allowed to move forward and strike that uh, primer, which is, uh, which is pretty cool. But if instead 
Um, the weapon is cocked and the, and the shooter decides he doesn't want to shoot at all. Um, and he releases the cocking um, lever. That firing pin block and drop safety is released and moves back up the channel, but the firing pin is prevented from making contact with the primer of a chambered cartridge because the sear bar is still um, in front of the firing pin. Whereas when I pull the trigger, the sear bar is, is, is below the firing pin. It's out of the way now, and the firing pin can move all the way forward. But if I just re release the action here, the sear bar still prevents it from uh, engaging any further. So it's the, the firing pin is just far enough back at this point where it can't make contact uh, with the chamber cartridge. Um, so that's how the drop safety works. Um, a lot of people don't really understand its functionality or, or its feature or even uh, you know what it is inside the slide, um, but hopefully that makes it a little more clear. Okay. Um, while we're on the subject of firing pin block, uh, drop safeties uh, over the life cycle of the P7 series. Uh, this part was actually updated twice, uh, so there's three different models uh, in order for it to be made both stronger and more reliable. Okay, so as you can see here uh, from this drawing in the uh, P7 series armor manual, uh, the first was in production from 1978 to 85, the next from 85 to 87, and then the final variant from 87 onward. Okay, and then you can see a circle around the second variant uh, reflects a larger engagement surface uh, for the sear bar to interface with, while the circle around the third variant uh, references a reinforced engagement area for the firing pin pawl to, in to interface with. And uh, the firing pin block spring was also updated during 1985-87 uh, change to make it uh, more resilient as well, uh, keep it from breaking. I'll cover more on uh, those parts upgrades for the P7 series uh, later in the video. Okay, now let's get back to the progression of the P7 series. Uh, by 1980, uh, the P7 was entering service with the German police forces and was being evaluated for service within the German military police at their schoolhouse in uh, Sonthofen. Uh, this BW marked P7 represents uh, one of those uh, for the German military service. Uh, it was also added to HK's uh, commercial catalog, and with the establishment of HK USA in Arlington, Virginia, it was released to their U.S. commercial market in the fall of 1980. And as you can see here in this 1980 uh, sales catalog pricing sheet, you can see the P7 had a suggested retail price of $550, which is actually $40 lower than the P9S 9mm at the time, uh, which is pretty cool. Still a very expensive pistol um, for that time period, um, but significantly less than where it would be at the end of its production run. Um, each P7 was issued with a green rectangular cardboard box with a P7 sticker on the top and a serial number on the, uh, on the side. Uh, inside, you'd find a thin layer of green foam, and then beneath it uh, was the pistol separated by a cardboard insert uh, to hold the spare magazine. Uh, you had the gas cylinder scraper tool and brush, uh, a manual, a warranty card, and a test target. Uh, later, those green boxes would be replaced with a uh, hard uh, black plastic model um, with a designation on the top and a serial number on the front side. Uh, inside were divided sections to hold those same previously mentioned uh, items. Uh, also, the initial uh, commercial variants uh, of the P7 sold in the U.S. Uh, are now commonly referred to as the Arlington P7s because of the Arlington, Virginia import markings uh, that came from uh, that came on the slides and receivers. Um, uh, these came with, originally with the protruding mag release, uh, but like the German issue pistols mentioned previously, those were changed out to the flush mounted ma magazine release. Uh, this change occurred around 1982, and often if a uh, early P7 was returned to HK repair, that new style magazine magazine release was uh, swapped in at a, at a no cost uh, to the uh, to the owner. As seen here, uh, we have a heavily embellished example 
of a P7 with a uh, wooden display case that was also available on special request for purchase. Now, with uh, the new U.S. footprint and viewing the P7 as the ideal pistol, H&K soon uh, decided to pursue contracts with law enforcement agencies as well as military programs. And uh, the first major requirement came in early 1981 with the Joint Service Small Arms Program, which was aimed at finding a suitable military service pistol replacement for the aging 1911. Uh, the initial requirements laid out 73 specific conditions. Uh, most notable among them were it had to be caliber 9mm. They wanted a magazine catch mounted high on the receiver. They wanted ambidextrous slide release and safety, uh, single action and double action mode, a phosphate finish, a barrel of at least four inches, and a magazine capacity of at least 10 rounds. Um, in July of 1981, a conference was held between military representatives and those of firearms manufacturers wishing to participate uh, in the program, and a great number of uh, companies attended. But it was made clear that uh, the military was only interested in seeing the latest designs. Uh, from German companies, we had Walther, Sig, Sauer, and uh, H&K uh, that were all eager to participate, uh, but no one had a pistol ready that met all of those requirements. Um, to make things more difficult, uh, the military directed that the manufacturers choosing to participate had to have their offer submitted uh, by 15 August, which was little more than a month away. Uh, this requirement was for a minimum of 30 test pistols uh, under the new program designation of XM9 Personal Defense Weapon. Um, so not an easy task. Uh, but for H&K, for obviously a uh, decision was to rapidly modify a P7 for submission. Uh, serial numbers 27841 through 27873 uh, were taken out of production and their magazine capacity was increased to 10 rounds. Um, by welding a 23 millimeter extension to the frame. Um, also, an extension was welded to the magazine housing to allow the use of a modified grip. Uh, here's an example of the magazine used, uh, which you can see is just uh, two P7 magazines that have been welded together and then adding two numbers uh, to the witness holes. Um, these pistols were given the uh, addition of the letter A, uh, which uh, stood for uh, I'm not even going to try and pronounce the German word, but it means working title. Um, additionally, the number 10 reflects the pistol's 10-round capacity, and you'll see this kind of designation carry over with the rest of their P7 series designs. Uh, the left side of the plastic grip show the marking P7, and the right side, XM9, and the name of that second uh, test series for the program. Uh, Though the photos shown on the test model, uh, serial number VM0034, uh, shows no import markings. Uh, the other examples all possess Arlington, Virginia import markings and IB date codes um, uh, showing 1981 production. Uh, of the 34 pistols manufactured and submitted for testing, 19 of those were later sold on the commercial market and the rest are maintained by H&K. Uh, with these weapons, H&K was able to uh, make the submission timeline with the P7A10, um, but while still utilizing a heel magazine release, it did not meet the requirement for a magazine catch mounted high on the uh, receiver, um, but they promised that the designers were busy working on that and they'd have the mo that modification as well as several others uh, very quickly. Um, so at the same time, in August 1981, production of the fully capable submission pistol, which would be termed the P7A13, uh, began with delivery just two months later in October uh, for the U.S. government testing. Um, an additional 34 of these pistols were produced for the inclusion of the testing with the XM9 trials, and these pistols were given the same exact serial numbers as the variation for the P7A10, with serial numbers 27841 through 27873, and a test model uh, VM0036. Uh, though I neglected to, uh, to mention this previously, VM stands for Versuch Modal um, or Test Modal. Um, as you can see by looking closely here, um, with this match set of uh, P7A10 and P7A13, uh, this replication of serial numbers means that there are two types of US te test weapons with the same serial numbers, which is uh, also pretty unique. 
Um, aside from the difference in dimension of the receiver, uh, which resulted in the use of a new double stack 13 round magazine, um, as you can see in the side by side photo, um, here are the features that uh, differentiate a P7A13 from a P7A10. Uh, first, the magazine lever is now an ambidextrous lever placed on both sides of the grip above the cocking lever. Um, at the bottom rear, uh, there's a lanyard loop uh, where the uh, magazine release used to be. Underneath the gas cylinder, uh, there's a plastic heat shield mounted to the frame uh, to prevent the shooter from burning his uh, index finger, uh, which is caused by the overheating during rapid fire and uh, sustained fire. Uh, the model designation A13 can be found on the right side below the ejection port and on the right side of the frame. Uh, the grip panel design was changed uh, from that random stipple pattern to longitudinal grooves on Bakelite construction. Uh, likewise, the left side grip panel was modified to reflect P7A13. Um, and though uh, later added to both, uh, for ease of disassembly, the uh, firing pin bushing was redesigned in order to allow it to be removed without the use of the special disassembly tool. Um, as you might expect, uh, personally getting to expect uh, this, uh, this, P7, uh, sorry, this PSP and P7A13 uh, was an incredibly uh, awesome experience for me. Um, just really, really unique guns that you only otherwise get to see in books um, or, uh, or museums. Uh, the testing for the V, uh, I'm sorry, the testing for the XM9 program ran through 1984 uh, with a final procurement recommendation made in January 1985. Uh, the two finalists uh, ended up being the Six Hour P226 and the Beretta 92, uh, with the Beretta 92 being selected as the new military service handgun, uh, which really came down to the ability to provide a lower cost for the entire package, uh, which included um, the magazines. Um, so there you go, lowest bidder. Um, it's still a great weapon, um, but you can see that there were there were others that were uh, that performed very well that just didn't meet out simply on cost. Um, and uh, there you go. So that was XM9. The next big program was the P80, um, which was happening at that same period, um, 1983. The Austrian Army uh, announced a procurement pro program for a new military service pistol. And among those participants were Six Hour with their P220, which at the time was a 9mm variant, uh, the P225, the P226. Uh, Beretta submitted two models. Steyr submitted their GB80. And an uh, unknown guy at the time named Gaston Glock um, has submitted his Glock 17. Um, HK submitted the P80, which was a transitional model falling between the P7 and what would soon be known to become the P7M8. Um, in an effort to become more attractive to the Austrian government, H&K worked this contract under license with an Austrian company called Voer, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, V-O-E-R-E, -E, uh, to present these weapons. Um, initially, 21 pistols were manufactured by H&K as P7s, and then modified to P80 and shipped to Voer. Uh, they have the following serial numbers um, ranging from uh, 40151 through 40162 and then 40181 through 40189. Uh, an additional 15 were manufactured by VOR and submitted in total to the trials. Uh, shown here, you can see serial number 40155 uh, like 40151 that preceded it is simply a P7 with the removal of all the markings on the uh, slide and receiver uh, in the standard fashion. Uh, in their place on the left side, you can see a large lettering with the caliber 9mm nine by, nine by 19. And then on the right side, uh, the serial number is placed on the slide and in P80 unique feature uh, on the receiver, also at the front of the trigger guard. Uh, the grips are moved on both sides um, I'm sorry, the grips are marked on both sides with a P80. I'm sorry, HKP80. Um, as you can also see, the magazines uh, were marked P80 as well. Uh, with serial number 40152 uh, and almost all the following after, excluding 40155, which I just showed you, uh, a focus in heat dissipation was addressed. 
uh, the top of the trigger guard area was actually milled out from the inside and a very small polymer heat shield was added. Uh, the original steel trigger was also changed to a thick polymer variant and also um, at the rear we see a change with the firing pin bushing that was instituted first in the XM9 pistols uh, that allowed the, the firing pin to be removed without the use of a special tool. Um, this spe um, specific pistol successfully completed 18,000 round endurance test uh, for the program. Another five uh, P80 pistols were later delivered for the second phase of testing in May of 1987, but in the end, uh, though the P80 had performed well in all the testing, the Glock 17 was chosen and has been in service ever since with the Austrian military. Uh, these days, it's uh, rare indeed to see one of these P80s in the wild, um, but I know of at least one. So, even though those two military trials did not secure contracts for H&K, they did lead to the product's improvements um, over the original P7 uh, in what would become the P7M8 and the P7M13, uh, which then remained the mainstay of the model line through the rest of its production. Uh, beginning in 1983, the first prototype P7M13 pistols were numbered uh, 001 through 059, and uh, the serial production began with serial number 71101. Uh, the design of the P7M8 uh, shows all features inherent to the P7M13, uh, but it's dimensionally equal uh, to that of the uh, P7. The 54 prototypes of the P7M8 have a serial number range uh, from 001 through 044 and 1001 through 10010. Uh, serial production began with serial numbers 81251. Uh, the designation of the M8 and M13 reflect the difference in magazine capacity of 8 and 13 rounds, and the main difference between the two models um, being really the width of the receiver in order to accommodate uh, that larger magazine um, in the P7 M13. So let's take a closer look at these uh, three examples. I've got a P7, I've got a P7 M8, and I've got a P7M13. Okay, If I hold them up here, um, what we'll notice if we look at the slides is that the P7 and the P7M8 look very similar, um, but at the rear we'll see the change in the firing pin bushing from a flush mounted one that requires a special tool um, to a now extended one that does not require it. That same carryover in the P7M13 as the M8. Um, next, we can see that there was a change in the front and rear sights. Um, so on the original P7, got a, a small dovetail here for the front sight. You can see it's smooth on the top, and then a small uh, rear dovetail smooth on the top. But with the P7, M8, and M13, what we'll see now is at the front, they have um, changed the size, the height of the front sight, and there's now a small hole in the front of the sight, and this actually extends through the front of the slide all the way down to where the barrel is. And in, in holding it in place now is a, is a small roll pin, and this was designed to prevent the uh, front sight from drifting uh, once it's in place correctly. And then at the rear, you'll see now I have a much larger dovetail for the rear sights on the M-series pistols, and I now have a large uh, screw through the top of the, slot, of the uh, sight, and again, that's designed to hold that rear sight in place to prevent it from moving. Um, and here's an example of what they look like. You know, disassembled, take, this, take the rear sight off, large uh, set screw hold it in place for the rear sights, and then the front sight, again, with its hole, and then there's a small roll pin that would then fit inside that hole, and then protrude down inside the slide to hold that in place. Um, HK continued uh, this design on the, uh, the P7 M8 and M13 until about KB or KC date codes. Uh, I have to check for, uh, for accuracy there, but at that point they decided it was not necessary to, uh, 
to make these additional um, steps. Uh, so all of the design, the uh, all the models afterwards um, would just come with a uh, a solid uh, rear sight and a solid front sight, and there was no longer the hole in the front of the slide uh, for a roll pin uh, to be held there. Um, flipping the uh, the slides over, one of the unique features that came out with the M series pistols which most people probably never even noticed. You'll notice two holes here. One uh, right here. This is actually a hole that they actually have to drill through um, for you to actually mount the uh, extractor. There's a little angle on the extractor that fits in that hole right there. But it's this other smaller hole we're trying to look at right there. And that um, is, is pretty revolutionary at the time. It's a relief port just behind the breech face um, that is put there to prevent gunk from building up uh, where inside the firing pin channel. So you got all that carbon build up from firing and, uh, and what it can do is just continue to pound itself forward and forward and forward until it can actually create a wall in front of the firing pin hole in the breech face. And this gunk uh, relief valve allows uh, some of that gunk to, to be forced out of that hole um, it's a neat feature um, that was successful in the M series, and it's carried over to all the other um, uh, pistol line and, and most of the uh, the rifle lines as well. If you look closely on their their bolt design, um, so pretty cool. Um, on the receivers, uh, we can see that with the uh, P7 M8 and M13, um, we now have a longer trigger guard and one that is angled down lower. So the original P7. Uh, sitting here side by side, if I can hold them there, you can see, we can see now obviously there's much more room forward of the trigger and you can see how it kind of angles down here and then kicks out whereas this one's just straight on. Um, this obviously helps with gloved hands. Um, we'll notice that um, the trigger is now wider um, and, uh, and it's made of polymer whereas the original P7s had a steel trigger We'll notice it's now got an ambidextrous paddle mag release on either side. Just push down to release the magazine versus the earlier uh, European heel release. Um, we'll notice obviously the heat shield uh, that's been put in front of the trigger guard and that's to dissipate the heat coming off of uh, that gas cylinder area to the shooter. And then at the base, we'll notice there's a lanyard loop that's been installed and it's both on the M8s and the M13s uh, here for that service. Uh, internally, some of the, uh, the parts remain the same uh, with the P7 uh, as they do as the, in the M13 and the M8, um, but uh, many of them uh, actually do, uh, do change. Uh, of note, with the barrel of the P7 M13 versus the M8 and the, M and the original P7, the uh, feed ramp is actually wider on the uh, the P7 M13 barrels than it is on the other two, which is kind of neat. So um, designed to, to feed the hollow point ammunition that they were expecting more of the tactical units that would be employing the M13s with, um, kind of cool. Okay, another difference in the P7 series um, from the upgrades with the M series pistols is a change in the actual gas piston itself. So if we look closely here at the P7 here in my left hand and the P7 uh, M13, M8's the same way, uh, you'll see that what we have here is a very straight angle on a squared out notch on the actual slide and kind of a rounded look here on the gas piston. Whereas on the M13, we'll notice it's squared on one end, but on this side, it's actually stepped you can see it kind of comes over the ledge and then up and on the slide as well as on the gas piston itself. So these aren't interchangeable. If you have a P7, you need a P7 gas piston. If you have a P7 M8, M13, M10, you need their specific gas piston. Um, so that can get guys in trouble um, sometimes when they're ordering uh, those parts and they order the wrong gas piston for their pistol and they won't be able to get it fit in the gun. Uh, this is also a good place to point out um, that the gas pistons are not just sold as, as solid pieces. And what I mean by that is uh, inside the gas piston, 
there are individual components. So uh, I'll give you an example here. This is a uh, incomplete uh, P7, M8, or M13 gas piston, okay? And what I mean by incomplete is it's missing the components here. If you look really closely, you'll notice a very small hole right there, and that's where a roll pin fits. And then you'll notice there's an opening on the inside fits down that channel, okay? And then you'll notice the same thing on, on an original P7 one. There's a small little hole for a roll pin and open in the top. What you have are these three small items. Okay, there's your roll pin. Here is a small little detent and then a spring. Okay, and what's this designed to do is that the detent fits up against the spring like that, and then the roll pin fits right through that hole in the side of the detent and holds everything in place inside the gas piston back there. And then the big hole on the side of the gas piston is what the roll pin right there holds it all to the slide. Okay, and then under spring tension, you'll notice here if I hold this all together, you notice there's a little bit of, of bounce movement here. That's the detent under spring tension being forced up against that roll pin. Okay, you need that action in order to uh, have reliable function of the slide. And what has happened is uh, there are some times where there's part suppliers who have either removed these components out of the gas pistons in order to make more money by selling you all the individual components, or they've just ordered them inappropriately uh, as incomplete items instead of complete ones, and they're selling them that way and the owners don't know. And I see this problem a lot when guys are saying they're having problems with their guns and they send me the gun, and the first thing I notice is, is I pick the gun up and I shake it and I'll hear a rattling sound. And what that tells me is there's no spring and detent and this uh, piston just bouncing around inside there with no tension. So if you're gonna order the P7 the gas pistons, make sure you uh, get an, a complete one. And if they don't have a complete one, you don't have an incomplete one, uh, you know now you need those three small components in order to make it complete um, to reassemble it all. And if you ever have problems, just give me a call. I'd be happy to help you guys out. Okay. Um, and now let's talk about the magazines. Um, obviously, many people confuse uh, the P7 uh, magazine with the P7 M8 magazine. They look very, very similar um, from design. If you looked at them next to each other, saw a picture of them, you, you, you might mix them up. Um, obviously, uh, H&K was aware of this, so you'll see the markings. The original P7 magazine just is marked P7. You'll see the caliber, and then there's a date code to tell you when it's produced. Whereas the P7M8 magazine says P7M8, same thing, um, caliber and date code. So obviously look for P7 versus P7M8. The other way to notice them is the P7 one has a big square cutout on the rear, so it can engage with that heel mag release. Whereas the P7M8 has this notch uh, welded on there uh, to the front, which engages the paddle mag release. So if you didn't see those markings, and you're trying to, to uh, figure out which one you had, uh, you could look at them that way. Uh, the P7M13 um, magazine will have uh, similar markings uh, here on the base uh, with the, uh, the model, the caliber, and the date code. Um, and then um, a very unique design of a double feed to single stack, whereas most double feed magazines just go straight up like that. Uh, H&K did not want to change the dimensions of the receiver uh, uh, with all the internal components, so that forced them to have to neck down uh, this angle when it was fully seated in the magazine well, or else they'd have to change all the other dimensional things they didn't want to deal with. Um, so that's how they've come up with this feature of, of these angles of double stack, single stack. You'll notice that they went to these larger vertical windows instead of uh, instead of the circular inspection windows that you have in the P7 and P7M8 magazines, and it's closed in on the other side. Uh, these are probably uh, the, the best, most well-built magazines I think I've, I've seen on a production pistol. And uh, they were expensive when they were uh, in production, and they're even more expensive now um, getting a hold of these things. Uh, but they work really, really well with those pistols. 
Um, most people will agree that the grip size of the P7 and uh, P7M8 is the most ideal um, as far as being comfortable uh, for carry. Um, but side by side, you'll notice there's really not that great a difference. So let me get out my caliber here and I'll show you. If I pick up a P7M8 and I measure it here at the grip, I'm at 1.151 inches. Okay, now if I hold up the P7M13, measured at the grip, I'm at 1.263. So between 1.151 and 1.263 is not a drastic size difference. Um, but if you hold them up next to each other, wow, look at how it looks so much bigger. And that's because the opening is bigger for the magazine well. But if you'll notice the space here, how much thicker the grips are on either side, um, that's where the difference is. So it's it's not really that, that large a difference as far as carrying, though it does look somewhat more massive um, when you put them next to each other. Okay. So, uh, like the P7 before it, the P7M8, P7M13 uh, were initially offered with the same green cardboard box um, as the P7 and the P9S had been, um, but soon a transition was made to the uh, black hard plastic case with the model specific uh, designation on the top and the serial number on the front, and inside you would find a sectional um, design that held the pistol, the spare mag, uh, the gas cylinder, scraper tool, and brush. And then on the top, there was a little tuck-in area for the manual, the warranty car, and the test target. Uh, a manual, I'm sorry, a wooden display case, like the one previously referenced for the P7, was also available for the P7, M8, and M13 uh, for an extra $159 uh, when they were first debuted. Um, and as the P7, M8 was intended to be the product improvement for the P7, uh, in 1984, um, we saw the last year that the P7 was produced, and by 1985, it was removed from uh, the product catalog um, and the price list. Um, but before it disappeared, one final commemorative model came out in 85, um, uh, shown here with a golden embellishment on it. I've seen one of these in uh, HK's gray room, and I recently saw these two um, sold from a gun shop. Uh, which is a pretty rare find and um, pretty cool to, uh, to see these going into private hands. Uh, now, you might think that this is the last we'd see the P7, but of course you'd be wrong. Um, in the 1990s, a few more rare variants the P7 rolled out of, uh, of HK Germany. Uh, first was the P7E, um, which is shown here with a KA date code reflecting 1990 production. Um, it was not included in the product offering of that year's material, um, unusually, um, and the E standing for export model. Uh, approximately 150 of these pistols were imported and sold into the U.S. on the commercial market. Uh, the backstory on these pistols is that with the fall of the Berlin Wall in 89 and the cancellation of the G11 program, of which HK was significantly over leveraged on, um, there was a cleaning out of the spare parts bins to assemble anything that they can make quick money from. I mentioned a similar example of this with the P9 series uh, in the video review I did on those pistols. Um, and, uh, and that reflects with this uh, the P70 model. Uh, the second one uh, that came out uh, was a small amount of KE date coded uh, P7s. Uh, these didn't have any special markings and they were imported in 1984. Again, the assumption um, that we're operating under with these is that, you know, again, there's a discovery of a quantity of, of spare parts sufficient enough to warrant assembly of complete weapons for sale, uh, and these were pushed out. Um, not, not nearly as many of these as, as, uh, as the earlier models. And then finally, in 1997, we saw a, uh, a last production run of 500 P7s to hit the U.S. commercial market. As uh, you can see here from this example, these pistols are easily identified by the PSP marking on the right side of the slide. Um, as you, I'll show you later, these uh, uh, KH date coded PSP marked uh, P7 uh, pistols were added to the uh, 1998 product catalog. Um, all three of these late production models 
due to their date codes and special markings, make them a little more valuable to collectors than the original uh, commercial import P7s we saw from the 1980s. Now let's get back to the uh, P7, M8, and M13. Uh, the first large contract for these pistols came from the New Jersey State Troopers, which actually began uh, first phase testing for their new service uh, pistol in April of 1982. At the time, H&K had actually submitted a sample of their P9S, their VP70Z, the P7, and the P7A13 uh, from the uh, XM9 trials. Uh, the P7 was the unanimous winner of these trials, um, but a requirement for a high-mounted ambidextrous magazine release and disassembly without the use of tools uh, required HK to uh, make some adjustments to it, um, and they replaced that P7 entry in the fall of 1983 with the P7 M8, um, which was immediately uh, adopted by the New Jersey State Police, as seen here in their January, February 1984 issue of the Police Marksman. Um, they were pretty proud of their new sidearm. Uh, of note here with this one, uh, it looks like they just have uh, two magazines in the uh, pouch, but it, it's actually subdivided, so there's uh, four total magazines in the pouch for a total of 80 rounds carried by, I'm uh, not 80, sorry, 40 rounds carried by the uh, individual officer. Throughout the remainder of the 1980s, the P7M8, and P7M13 also uh, saw adoption by numerous federal and state agencies, the U.S. Capitol Police, U.S. Park Police, Department of Energy, uh, the Navano Navajo Nation Police, and uh, the Utah Highway Patrol are all some of the most well-known. Uh, the Department of Energy actually had such a following uh, that as the pistols were being phased out, one of their specific sites collected all of the pistols within the inventory so they can ensure that their teams remained armed even after the rest of their organization had transitioned to a new pistol. Um, later, HKUSA would hire a retired captain from the New Jersey State Police to oversee their local law enforcement section, and his experience with the P7M8 uh, pistols was a great influence to uh, LE customers as well. Uh, within U.S. SOF, uh, the weapons also found a solid following, especially for missions requiring concealed carry and the stories from their glory days at the palace, uh, which was HK's Chantilly site, uh, with those special visitors uh, reinforces uh, that statement, even though you don't really see a lot of publications uh, showcasing those things. Um, you know, I've had a specific assignment that uh, I was very pleased to find had P7M8 and P7M13s in their armory, and uh, I took those out every chance I could to train with it. It was really uh, cool. To, uh, to find out that those guys had, had these weapons in such high esteem. Uh, outside of the U.S., these pistols proved extremely popular with military and soft units in a counterterrorism role. Uh, Norway, France, and Greece had adopted the P7M8, as did Iceland, uh, for a special unit of their national police called the Viking Squad. Uh, I don't really know <laughs> about you, but I think that's probably the coolest name uh, for a, a counterterrorism unit. Um, going. Um, and I told you the story during the P9 series video of how the Saudis had canceled an order of the P9S and replaced it with an order of the P7 as soon as troopers from Germany's GSG-9 showed up in country to help them with a counterterrorism training and they were armed with the new P7 uh, series pistols. Uh, so that's pretty cool. Uh, they went on to adopt the, uh, the P7M8 and the P7M13 um, as well, and I just recently had the privilege of having uh, one of those P7M8s from Saudi um, come across my workbench, uh, which, as you can see here, has the unique uh, slide markings. In April 1986, a product improvement of parts was introduced to the P7M8 and P7M13 pistol line to address either reliability or safety concerns. Uh, this primarily stemmed from an incident where a German police arm officer armed with a P7 uh, claimed to have dropped his pistol while climbing a stairwell and the weapon discharged as a result of the impact. Uh, though H&K apparently was never able to recreate the incident, they updated several internal parts to make sure that uh, this absolutely could not happen again. And those other parts were uh, done simply to make um, them more resistant to breakage through normal use. Uh, as you can see here, this live chart maintained at uh, HK Defense 
showcases the original parts for the P7 and M series pistols on the left and the updated parts on the right. Uh, these parts were placed into all of the production uh, P7 series pistols uh, after that date and to any of the pistols that returned for service to H&K's repair department. Uh, so these parts included the following. Uh, you had number one, the firing pin block or drop safety um, and uh, the drop safety spring. Um, then the firing pin, the trigger, the sear bar, the sear spring, um, the cocking lever and the drag lever. And you can see some of those are specific to the P7 and, uh, and some of them carried over to the uh, M-Series. Um, besides the trigger, all of these parts specifically interface with each other, uh, which means if you change one, you have to change at least one of the other, and there's kind of a domino effect that continues. So in lies the problem, is that if you possess a P7 or a P7 M8 or M13, um, that has not received these updated parts, and one of those original parts breaks, you'll have a very hard time finding that original part um, as they were discontinued uh, from production in 1986. So the part that you source most likely will be the updated version, and thus may not properly interface with the others in your pistol. So it's pretty much an all or nothing type of thing. Um, the exception is that some of the owners of the early P7 M8 and M13s prefer the look of what's referred to as the fat trigger um, and choose to leave that in place while updating the other uh, specific parts. So if you've got a P7 um, in one of those Arlington guns or you've got one of the very early um, P7 M8 or M13s, you know, crack them open, take a look at uh, the internal components to see um, you know, which one you have. And uh, if you have questions, give me a shout. I'll be happy to help you guys out. Um, another question I get a lot relates to the different types of finishes. Um, though there's an occasional rare example out there that breaks from the norm, uh, the P7, the P7M8, and the P7M13 were all offered in black. Uh, in 1982, though, a large production run was made of the P7M8, M13, and the M10, which we'll cover later, uh, in nickel. Uh, this single year of production makes these guns more rare and collectible, but you know personally I don't care for them. I don't think the nickel wears very well, and it ends up chipping and flaking in the high wear items, and and it shows any level of carbon buildup really glaringly. Um, of course, the critics will quickly point out that you know Hans Gruber had a nickel P7 M13 and Die Hard, and, and that wasn't released until 1988. Um, and and what about you know, the nickel P7M7 that Ian did in Forgotten Weapons channel from HKD's Grey Room. Yeah, like I said, there are a few breaks from the norm, but the vast majority of those pistols um, you're going to see in black. Uh, many people have chosen over the years to have their P7 series pistols refinished in nickel, um, often as a way to cover up wear on the original finish. You see that a lot with the German police trade-in pistols we'll talk about later. Um, but... Um, Seeing those pistols with date codes other than KC, um, that one single year of production, uh, can often confuse buyers when they're looking at these guns. So the easy way to tell an original model um, from one that's been refinished, besides the date code, is to look at the grip screws and the takedown button. Um, on the original guns, uh, those parts were not finished by H&K and they remained in their initial, initial black. So the, the grip screws will be black, the takedown button will be black. Uh, but when people have their guns refinished in nickel, almost always the refinisher just coats all the parts. So you'll see those items in nickel instead of black. Um, this photo is uh, also unique as it's the first year production of an M8 um, pistol um, that has obviously been refinished. Um, the... Uh, Though it has the ID date code um, uh, on the other side, you can identify this model as being uh, from the initial year uh, and being a unique P7M8 marking on that left side of the slide right there by the front of the barrel. The other, other models that followed it uh, changed the way the P7M8 was, was uh, inscribed on the weapon. Uh, also of note in this picture, um, you'll see that the magazine is marked P7. Um, unlike how I originally uh, mentioned, uh, H&K changed that to P7M8 in order to eliminate confusion 
between the heel magazine and the paddle release magazine variant. So obviously a very early model here. It's also important to cover that in 1987, uh, HK instituted a new classification for serial number codes across their ever expanding line of weapons. Uh, each model of the weapon would receive a specific two or three number prefix code. Um, and to make sure uh, they covered everything, uh, the, those codes began with weapons that were at the time no longer in production or some that never even made it out of prototype phase. Uh, so for our purposes here, uh, we're just going to be covering the P7 series. Um, and that meant that P7 uh, series pistol produced after this date would have the following serial number prefix codes on the right side of the receiver. Uh, for the P7, it started with 15. P7M8 was 16. P7M13 was 17. P7K3 was 18. P7M7 was 19. And the P7M10 was 0 to 1. So as you can see here, I've got a um, IH date code uh, P7. Um, so it predates this change, and you can see it, it does not have a prefix here, um, but yet I have a later date code pistol that has a 17 um, dash. So you can see now that prefix code has taken effect, and that can sometimes confuse um, buyers when they're looking at the pistols as well. Now let's look at uh, variations of the P7M8 and P7M13 pistols. Uh, the first ones that uh, are usually mentioned with interest within the uh, collector circles um, are the P7M8 and P7M13 pistols that have markings on the left side of the slide um, that say HK demo only. Uh, these pistols were um, early examples in the ID and IE date code range and were identified uh, this way um, as they were models that were temp load for organizations to test and evaluate uh, the new pistols. Similarly, uh, there were a number of P7, M8, and M13 pistols from the same date code range that were marked training program weapons, as you can see here, um, on the top left of the slide, and that these pistols were part of H&K's uh, newly formed International Training Division uh, for use in their armor and operator courses. As you might expect when these things pop up for sale, they, they garner quite a bit of attention. Uh, the next one we saw was uh, the P7M13S. Okay, this variation of a P7M13 uh, with the S standing for safety, as these models had the uh, addition of a slide mounted, I'm sorry, a side mounted um, safety device. Uh, these were commissioned for the Mexican Army in 1983 for an order of 3,000 pistols, uh, serial numbers uh, 10001 to uh, 13000. Um, the safety is completely redundant, though. Um, and oddly enough, uh, this example here in private collection has an extra one added to the front of the serial numbers. Um, the model designation is on the left side of the slide, um, and the left side grips carry the abbreviation DIM for uh, Military Industrial Department. Uh, the right side of the grips are unmarked. Um, an undetermined amount of P7M8S pistols were also made and imported through HK's Chantilly, Virginia facility intended for U.S. distribution. Um, this one resides in HK's gray room. Um, mounted just above the trigger on the right side, uh, by a roll pin mounted vertically through the receiver. Um, you'll see that it slides forward and backwards and is marked uh, with a white zero and a red one. Uh, when in the safe position, it internally blocks the pistol from firing by preventing the trigger arm uh, from moving forward as the shooter attempts to pull the trigger to the rear. Um, so it's kind of neat to get to see inside one of these how that um, actually works. Uh, though again, like we said, it's it's a redundant feature that's not necessary because of the uh, cocking lever action that's already built into the pistols. Uh, the next pistols we saw were the uh, P7 PT8, uh, developed for training police and military um, in the community where uh, the lack of available training and live fire ranges was restricted. 
Uh, the PT stands for plastic training and eight indicating that this pistol is a modified version of the P7M8 with an eight round magazine capacity. Uh, the use of normal cartridges of nine millimeter is not permitted because the slide has no gas piston to reduce the velocity of the slide when the battery, uh, when going into battery. Uh, the recoil spring was redesigned and is copper coated. Uh, the pistol also has a floating chamber and the overall weight was reduced by 50 grams. Uh, these changes were necessary to ensure that uh, the proper function of the pistol when using the low impulse plastic training ammunition. Uh, the bullet and case shown here are comprised of one unit and a predetermined breaking point uh, has been incorporated into the cartridge and a thin walled uh, hollow bullet leaves the PT PT8 barrel about three times faster than a standard bullet but because of the low energy imparted on the impact uh, the relative danger zone is very minimal. Uh, the first PT8 serial number 42457 had a blue colored slide uh, but with all consecutive examples, uh, they changed to a blue dot on the side of the slide uh, near the muzzle. Uh, the description on the slide reads 9mm times 19 PT. On the left side of the grip, uh, you have HK P7 PT8. These weapons proved to be very reliable, with the first two test examples successfully firing 10,000 and 9,000 rounds, respectively, without issue. Um, Though these types of weapons and cartridges remain somewhat popular in Europe, they never really caught on here in the U.S. Uh, law enforcement market. In the fall of 1984, a new smaller version of the P7 series caught the eye of HK fans at the Luxembourg um, Police Exposition. This first announcement of the new P7 K3 uh, followed with the market in 1985. With the K3 standing for three calibers, um, this variation of the P7 to 8 is very similar to uh, the approach of HK's early development of the HK4 in that it offered three different calibers um, with the same pistol. Uh, it was available for 22 LR, uh, 7.65 millimeter, or what we call 32 ACP here in the US, 9 millimeter short, or 3D ACP. Magazine capacity in all three calibers was eight rounds, uh, swapping calibers between 32 and 380, just required um, changing the magazine and then swapping out the barrel uh, through the use of an included barrel wrench. If you wanted to uh, change it to 22, you swapped out the magazine, the barrel, and the entire slide assembly um, in order to uh, make it function properly with rimfire cartridge. Uh, though it's uh, smaller in overall dim dimensions and shape, uh, the P7K3 is very similar to the uh, p 7 m um, but the P7K3 has an inertia blowback action via a hydraulic buffer instead of the gas piston uh, system that we see in the other uh, P7 series pistols. Uh, so therefore, there's no heat buildup in the slide, um, so that's why you don't see a, uh, a heat shield inside the, uh, the trigger uh, guard there. The 22LR barrel and uh, slide had a floating chamber, similar to the P7 PT8 in order to achieve sufficient recoil and in order to uh, comply with U.S. import restrictions for small frame pistols, uh, those P7 K3s imported in the U.S. Uh, came with a unique adjustable rear sight, uh, but that's easily swapped out as you can see I've done here with my P7 K3. I just put a standard set of uh, Tritium uh, M-series uh, sights on it, uh, which works well for me. Uh, test samples have the serial numbers of 001 and 8701 through 8764. Uh, serial production pistols were offered for sale in individual caliber configurations or as either two or three caliber sets. Obviously, the three caliber sets are the most desirable now for the collector market. Serial numbers were split into two different categories, one for the U.S. market uh, beginning with prefix code of 001, and one for the European market beginning with prefix code 101. Uh, as you can see for reference, the P7 K3 against the P7 M8, dimensionally, it's just a little bit more compact in the overall length. Um, and on the height, too, just a little bit shorter, um, but the width is the same. Um, on the pistol. Um, 
if you compare it against uh, you know other similar um, subcompact type 380, 32 pistols at the time, like a Walther PPKS, it, it's very similar to those as well. And I find that the smaller dimensions of this pistol make it really ideal for uh, summer carry when I'm really trying to be as slim as possible with my handgun under light clothing. Um, the Achilles heel of the P7K3, though, is the recoil buffer. Uh, it's a liquid-filled hydraulic buffer that will eventually fail and leak. Um, there are reports of this happening many years and many thousand rounds into ownership, and then there's other reports of it happening just sitting in the safe. Uh, but thankfully, there's an aftermarket option. Um, if you guys need new buffers, um, I can help you guys out with that as well, um, and I'll be happy to do so. And uh, having that option for me allows me to, you know, continue to use this thing confidently and carry it um, and enjoy it still. So it's it's great, uh, great gun, and it, it's got a unique recoil impulse different than the other P7M series pistols, and the um, that you just really got to try out to uh, to get an understanding for it. Um, while we're addressing um, the subject of properly maintaining the P7K3 pistol with the uh, recoil buffer. It's also a good time to address one of the most common issues I see with these pistols, um, and that's really understanding that the uh, recommendation from HK is that every time you fire this, that you should remove the barrel during your post-cleaning, uh, post-op maintenance, and uh, this allows you to provide proper lubrication to the barrel in those key areas, but it also prevents uh, the buildup of carbon and gunk and surface rust between the barrel and the barrel nut and the receiver. And quite often I'll receive a P7K3 from a customer because the barrel is seized and he can't get it off uh, with, the, uh, with the barrel wrench. Uh, so do yourself a favor, take the extra time to uh, remove the barrel after each time you shoot, um, and then you won't have those, those issues with your, with your pistol. Uh, next in the, in the lineup, in mid-1985, H&K responded to requests from a U.S. LE market for a 45 ACP variant of the P7 series. Um, and they developed uh, several new prototypes of a P7 M series um, that was designated the P7 M7, with the M7 standing for, as you might expect, magazine capacity of 7. Um, in order to accommodate the 45 ACP round, the pistol required a larger frame. It also uh, was found that the higher pressures associated with the 45 ACP cartridge versus the 9mm meant that the gas piston system uh, would not transfer over. Instead, like with the P7K3 design, uh, designers incorporated a hydraulic buffer in place of the traditional gas cylinder and piston. Uh, here you can see that uh, the traditional recoil spring was replaced with a stronger braided coil uh, recoil spring. And as the heat buildup associated with the gas piston system was not present with the P7M7, you'll notice that there was no need for the polymer heat shield utilized in the P7M8 and M13. Oddly though, they did leave the heat shield on serial number 002, which I'll show you in a minute. Um, it and serial number 003 uh, that you see here um, still use the polymer trigger from the M8 and M13 as well. Um, all other prototypes used a steel uh, trigger. Uh, only six prototypes uh, exist, and those are serial numbers 001M7 through 006M7. Um, of those, serial number 002, which I just mentioned, um, has a polymer trigger and heat shield for some reason. Um, and it is also different from the others in that is it is significantly shorter in length than the other models. Um, it's maintained at the uh, HK Defense uh, Gray Room. And uh, Ian from Forgotten Weapons did a great video review on the pistol you should go check out. Um, one of the uh, that's in private hands, serial number 006 shown here, um, the remaining uh, models are all kept at, uh, at HK Germany. Uh, because of the large tooling and production costs and the inability to perfect the hydraulic buffer system, as well as the lack of a specific end-user requirement, the decision uh, to exercise serial production was never made. Um, bottom line, the, the retooling cost to, to do this required a significant uh, uh, law enforcement or military contract, and, and none of those really ever materialized for the pistol. Um, so sadly, we're just... Uh, 
we, we don't get the privilege to uh, enjoy these uh, really cool uh, P7 pistols, but uh, my friend, knowing that I'm a big fan of Africa by Toto, uh, sent me this picture to brighten my day, and I thought I'd share it with you as well. Uh, next, we have the P7M13SD and P7M8SD. So, um, you know, some special customers have required suppression with their P7 uh, pistols, and Heckler & Koch responded by removing certain weapons from the P7M8 and P7M13 production lines to create um, what we know as the SD models. Uh, the only modification was a longer barrel with an external thread. Um, some also lacked a slide catch. Um, these pistols were made uh, between 1986 and 1988, and uh, they came with their own specially marked boxes. Uh, four different suppressors were developed for use with these pistols. Uh, the first one, SD-1, uh, was an in-house design that was based on the MP5 SD suppressor, uh, which as you can see, due to its size, had front and rear sights added to the suppressor itself. Uh, SD-2 uh, was made by the uh, Vime uh, company of Finland. I might be pronouncing that wrong. V-A-I-M-E, Vime, Vime. Not sure, um, but um, that's the one you most often see um, on these pistols that are out in the wild. Uh, SD3 was an in-house design made specifically for the pistols. I don't have a photo of this one at the time. And then the SD4 variant uh, was made by B&T, as you can see here in this, uh, this photo. Uh, unfortunately, the uh, gas-retarded blowback operating system of the P7 series proved not to be an ideal host for the suppressor. Um, a tremendous amount of blowback goes directly out of the ejection port and into the eyes of the shooter. And the carbon fouling uh, builds up quickly within the gas cylinder and the tight confines of the internal components, requiring even more attention uh, in maintenance cycles. So um, just not really ideal for suppression. Also, as I'll cover later as I discuss ammunition recommendations, we'll see uh, that shooting 147 grain subsonic ammunition was not a great idea either. Um, an interesting note for collectors though, um, there was a batch of 50 P7M13 SDs that were originally produced in 1995 for a European Special Forces unit, along with suppressors, which were uh, made by the Vimy company. Um, but for some reason that contract was never executed and the suppressors were never delivered. Uh, those pistols remained in storage at HK Germany uh, for many years before a decision was made to export 35 of them to uh, HKI for uh, civilian sale. Over the years, there's been some debate regarding the specific markings on these guns that creates confusion. Uh, as you'll see by this example, um, first the import marking of HKI Trustville, Alabama, uh, that's simply applied just prior to export and shows that when these guns were exported from HKO uh, and they were sent to HKI, um, that was just the location for that time period. Um, but the confusion really comes in the fact that there's a date code of KF, which would represent 1995 production. But the serial numbers don't include the two-digit two prefix of 17 um, for the P7 M13 series that I mentioned earlier that was instituted in 1987, uh, and uh, it should be present for pi pistols produced in 1995. Um, I have an internal document here um, that is uh, that discusses uh, this issue a little bit, and it comes to the conclusion that there. Um, that these weapons were made in that 1986 to 1988 range, like the others I mentioned previously, and then that it wasn't proofed until 1980, uh, 1995, um, receiving the stamps that you see on the, uh, on the weapon. Um, but upon inspecting these pistols myself, I found uh, two items that proved this to be incorrect. Um, first, the serial numbers, uh, though they are missing the two number prefix, uh, they still fall at the extreme end of production of the P7 M13 series. Um, if they had been produced you know, between 1986 and 1988, 
it would have started with seven or possibly eight, but not nine. Um, second, as also discussed earlier, uh, the P7M8 and the M13 um, that were produced in the 1980s had slides that um, accepted a different set of sights where the rear sight had a large set screw uh, and the front sight had a roll pin which was fit through a corresponding hole that was drilled in the top of the slide all the way to the opening of the barrel. Uh, and this was not changed until the 1990s. Uh, but as you can see here in these photos, um, these KF um, date-coded P7M13s have the updated sights and slides uh, without the roll pin hole, uh, which shows that they were not produced in the 1986-88 date range, and instead more likely in 1995, as the KF date code suggests. Um, regardless, I'm, I'm glad I finally was able to put to rest uh, this issue, and uh, I hope this uh, proves helpful to the owners of these five pistols. Um, due to the rarity, uh, most of, of these uh, pistols, once they were introduced um, into uh, the U.S., were sold internally within HK uh, to VIPs and to their own employees, uh, or, or were given as retirement gifts. Um, and as you might expect, several of those have made their way into private hands. Uh, for several years, I had the pleasure of owning uh, one myself, um, but as the value from the collector market continued to skyrocket, I just couldn't justify keeping an unfired one in the safe. And I sold it, making a healthy profit, um, which allowed me to fund my uh, MP7A1 purchase. Um, but with still enough left over that I actually sent the HK employee who had originally sold me the pistol I check with the remainder of the proceeds. So in the end, we all made out and everybody was happy. Um, but as you can expect today, these SD models remain some of the rarest and expensive on the uh, P7 series uh, here in the U.S. market. Um, also, one of the least well-known examples of these special P7 M13 um, models is uh, also utilizing the same extended and threaded barrel um, and an incredibly tall and connected front and rear sight set, um, these were produced uh, to be uh, connected to a special ball mount for firing through armored glass doors. Now onto the P7M10. Uh, this was the final evolution of the P7 series and it came in the early 90s uh, with the introduction of the 40 Smith & Wesson cartridge, which as those of us who are old enough to remember uh, this was all the rage at the time. Uh, with the USP still in development and not wanting to be left out without a pistol in this offering of uh, the new hot cartridge, uh, the decision was made to modify the P7M13 design in order to accommodate the 40 Smith & Wesson cartridge. Um, obviously, in keeping with the previous naming uh, structure, the M10 refers to a magazine capacity of 10 rounds uh, from a similar um, uh, magazine as we saw on the P7M13. Uh, initially, like the P7M7 uh, that was prototyped before it, the designers looked to overcome the challenges with the significantly higher pressure cartridge versus 9mm by incorporating a hydraulic buffer or even a dual gas brake, um, but making those updates would have resulted in extremely high expenses for tooling and uh, re-equipping of the product line, I'm sorry, production line. Um, so with the state of the company at the time being financially constrained, the easiest and most cost-effective route was chosen, and that meant utilizing the same gas-retarded blowback design, um, and in fact the same uh, receiver um, and slide as already in use with the P7M13. Um, as such, almost all the internal components uh, could be used in the new pistol. Obviously the barrel would be different, um, but other items like the extractor and slide catch, slide release, um, uh, which needed to be modified, were marked with a Roman numeral X, obviously for the number 10, uh, for ease of identification. So if you ever see those parts and you see it, an X written on there, now you know it's for a P7M10 and not, not one of the other P7 series pistols. Uh, also, with an eye on cost savings, uh, the P7M10 barrels uh, break from the norm of having uh, traditional lanes and grooves rifling instead of uh, the polygonal rifling like the rest of the P7 series. Uh, this was also seen in the first uh, couple years of production of the USP40 and 9mm pistols, 
which would be being developed and produced during the same period. Um, the initial prototypes um, shown here uh, looked identical to the P7M13, um, but much to the dismay of the fans and the HK uh, employees uh, charged with trying to sell them when the P7M10 was released at the 1991 SHOT Show, the size and weight of the slide had dramatically increased. Uh, this increase in mass was made in order to ensure the safe operation of the pistol, um, but at eight tenths of a pound heavier, and now with a much higher bore access, it lost much of the allure of the nine millimeters. Uh, sales began in 1992, um, where the pistols um, were offered in both a standard finish as well as the nickel, uh, of which a greater majority were produced in that nickel. Um, with the serial number coding system referenced earlier, the P7M10 serial production began with 021 prefix. Uh, additionally, the price, which at this point had an MSRP of $1,299, meant that this was now well outside the grasp of uh, almost all law enforcement organizations. In fact, I'm, I'm not really aware of any significant adoption of this weapon. Um, in fact, um, it was the rising cost of the entire P7 series over the years that, uh, partly due to the decline in the Deutsche Mark versus the dollar, uh, that was the main reason why in the 1990s, uh, adoption by law enforcement agencies was really becoming more and more of a rare occurrence. Uh, flipping through these selected pricing lists, when the P7M8 and P7M13 were first hitting the commercial market in 84 and 85, uh, the MSRP for a P7M8 was $599, with the P7M13 coming in at $669. Uh, by 1988, though, uh, those prices had already started to climb uh, to the fact that a P7M8 was now $881, and a P7M13 was now $1,099. By 1992, we saw a P7M8 now 1,039 and an M13 1,259, just $40 less than the P7M10. And then here in 2004, with P7M8 being the last man standing, a whopping $1,515. Um, and that's a significant difference from its initial entry into the market as the P7 back in um, in 1980 um, with a price of just over $500. Uh, with, with that and the enhancement, or I'm sorry, the enactment of the uh, Violent Crime Control and Law Enforcement Act of 1994, which included the provision of the federal uh, assault weapons ban, um, which among other things restricted handguns with a magazine capacity of more than 10 rounds, uh, H&K was forced to remove the P7M13 from their U.S. commercial catalog, though it was still offered in limited numbers uh, through their LEN mill catalog. Uh, as the P7M10 was made on the same production line and with no contracts and poor commercial sales and really none outside the U.S. market, uh, and the USP series, now the successful flagship model, uh, the decision was made to cease production on the P7M10 as well. Um, and enough remained in stock to be included in the 1995 cat uh, catalog, but after that it was gone. Um, it remains desirable within the collector circles though, especially if it can be found with the original box and associated kit. As you can see from this photo, um, the size of the slide meant that uh, the hard plastic cases for the P7M8 and M13 uh, just wouldn't work. So the P7M10 was issued with a throwback cardboard box like uh, we saw with the P7 series had been originally offered with. Um, but this time it was offered in gray instead of green. Um, also of note in this uh, well-presented example is an included note from uh, the warehouse manager at the time, which I think is just a nice personal touch that h &K should probably look at uh, instituting again. Uh, the next uh, special model was the P7M8 Jubilee, uh, which was brought in in 2004 to commemorate the 25-year anniversary of the P7. Um, 
this special limited edition model um, was a total of 500 produced and they were signed by the original designer um, and came with an attractive uh, um, set of HK engraved grips, a custom fitted uh, wooden case and a commemorative uh, P7 coin. Um, and even uh, had a, a really cool um, outer cardboard box too, um, which for collectors, they really wanna make sure they've got all those pieces. Uh, due to that rare nature, um, these pistols are highly prized by collectors and demand a significantly higher premium over the, uh, the original purchase cost. And I remember seeing these in gun shops when they first came out and nobody was buying them because um, you know, it was an expensive pistol at the time and who wanted a gun that you were really never going to shoot. And Now I think we're all kicking ourselves. We didn't buy three or four of them at the time to, to, uh, to put our kids through college with. Um, following that, we had the production of uh, the P7M8 carried on for four more years until 2008 when uh, the last 500 rolled off the assembly line. Uh, as seen here, these pistols were offered with a certificate of authentication showing that um, their specific number within that 500 uh, serial range. Um, additionally, on the right side of the slide, um, that same identification is also added. Um, it's been thought that the P7M13 production ceased somewhere around 1995, as we all saw it disappear from the U.S. commercial market. Uh, with that 1994 uh, assault weapons ban um, that I mentioned earlier. But as you can see here with these examples I recently got in from Europe, I have an AB date code, an AC date code, and an AE date code. Um, which uh, tells me that production obviously continued most likely in line with the uh, P7M8 until the uh, the end of the service with these uh, last 500 uh, pistols that we just uh, we just touched on. And to make things even more confusing, after these final last 500 P7M8 models were produced uh, and production was completely terminated, a bunch more used P7s and a small number of P7M8s were released onto the U.S. commercial market through. HKI, so allow me to discuss this issue. Now, although uh, current prices for P7, M8, and M13 has really kind of gotten out of control, you can still find some reasonably good deals on the uh, German police trade-in pistols, uh, specifically uh, the P7s, uh, and there are a few P7, M8s as well. Uh, the P7, M8s are easily identifiable, as I'll show you here in this picture, um, where they'll have import markings, obviously, that we'll touch on in a moment. But what you really notice is on the right side of the slide is what we call a mill mark, uh, where you can see there was an original uh, marking for the agency uh, that that pistol was issued to. And instead of leaving that in place, that uh, marking was completely milled off the receiver. Um, so that's one example. The most more common is what we see here, which is an original P7, um, and these, again, were issued uh, throughout uh, uh, Germany in different law enforcement agencies. And what happened was when those agencies then decided to trade up to a new service pistol, uh, H&K bought those pistols back from them. Uh, they refurbished them and then they imported them in through HKI in the U.S. for uh, commercial resale back onto uh, the U.S. market. Uh, pretty smart idea. And the way these are identifiable is on the left side of the receiver, you'll see an import marking. Uh, this one here is HKI Columbus, Georgia. You'll all say, see HKI Trustville, Alabama. And the reason this is, um, is that when H&K split and uh, became HKI and HKD, and HKI initially moved from Sterling, Virginia down to Trustville, Alabama, and then over to their current position in Columbus, Georgia. Uh, so you'll see one of those two markings on these guns. And that's obviously going to be noticeably different than the earlier commercial imports we saw in the 80s, which had Arlington, Virginia, or Chantilly, Virginia um, markings, uh, because the P7 series, was, uh, at least the P7 uh, PSP models were 
um, discontinued um, long before HK set up business here. Uh, so that's an easy identification. You'll also usually find the warning marking uh, here at the uh, bottom of the trigger guard. On the right side of the receiver, most often what you'll find is a BWB marking. You'll also see it here on the barrel. And you'll also find it here on the slide next to the serial number. Now the BWB marking is a federal acceptance stamp showing that this uh, weapon was approved for use uh, within uh, Germany. Next to that in the circle here are the letters NDS and that's a uh, stamp uh, that represents Lower Saxony, uh, German state where this specific pistol was issued. And then uh, just to the right of that, DE is a two-letter uh, code that represents Germany, uh, showing that it was manufactured in Germany. Uh, so those are the, the markings that will annotate these weapons as a original German police uh, uh, pistol and, uh, and sold on the market. Now these were brought in uh, and categorized in the condition that uh, HK felt that it was in. And you can usually see that by a sticker on the side of the box it came with that would either say grade A, grade B, or grade C. Uh, this one here is a grade A, and it looks pretty good because, of course, I just finished servicing it for the customer. Um, but what you'll find normally is that these pistols are usually carried more uh, than they were shot. So internally, they'll be in very good condition. Externally, you might see some finish wear um, on the... Uh, on the metal finish or some cracks or chips in the in the grip type. Uh, this one, as you can see here with the um, uh, right side of the grip removed, this has the uh, upgraded safety and reliability parts already added to it. So you've got the, the updated drag lever, sear spring, and sear bar. And inside the slide, we have the upgraded parts as well that obviously you can't see because they're all inside. Uh, but again, these make uh, great shooters, great carry guns, and for the money, you can usually find these for much less than you can an M8 or an M13. Uh, originally, when they came in through the country for import, they were selling for around the 750 range. Uh, now, I have seen them regularly selling anywhere from 1250 up to $2,000, uh, depending on the condition and, and really where you get them. Um, but if you're patient, you can find a good one. And uh, again, these are great, great shooters, or one to get yourself into uh, the P7 market without spending a whole bunch of money. Another unique feature you'll see on most of the German police trade-in pistols is a unique set of grips, uh, which uh, includes a slight thumb swell on the left side. Of course, it's not always the case, as if the grips were damaged or another owner along the way decided to change them, uh, you'll see these pistols with the standard flat commercial grips. Uh, but with that, we wrap up the known prototypes, production variants, and special mod models of the uh, P7 series that I'm aware of. Uh, I've heard of a model that was produced by the Manurin um, company for French use, um, but I've never seen one of those to confirm it. Um, and of course, um, what I've covered are the original H&K models. Um, there have been a few aftermarket modifications and creations like you see here with this long slide variant, um, but that one's not from H&K. Okay, so now let's talk about my personal experience with the P7 series from an armor perspective. Uh, first, let's cover uh, ammunition as that's really uh, where I often see uneducated owners run into problems. Uh, the operating system for the P7 series, it, it's just, it's not designed to work perfectly across the wide range of 9mm offerings we see today. Uh, especially the current hyper ammunition offerings that are in vogue. In the late 1970s, when this was designed, there was FMJ and uh, hollow points were really just kind of coming on the scene and they were far less pressurized than what we're seeing today. So the recommendation for safe, reliable operation is clean burning, 115 to 124 grain, standard pressure, factory produced, brass cased, quality ammunition from a reputable company. I know that's a mouthful, but that's what you need. Uh, steel cased ammunition, which does not have the same flex capability necessary to work with the barrel flute design mentioned earlier, um, is also not recommended. Reloaded, reloaded ammunition um, is also a no-go, um, just because you have to make sure that it's done right, and quite often it's not. Um, and for those of you who aren't aware, 
often when you go to an indoor and outdoor range and you're required to buy range ammo or you choose to buy range ammo, um, what you're getting is reloaded ammunition um, that is done in sometimes questionable um, practices and most often it's made up of the empty casings that are collected up from that range um, which could be of all different types and manufacturers and quality so uh, you know stay away from range type ammunition and uh, because lead does not work well with the polygonal barrels uh, don't use lead or unjacketed bullets uh, shooting lead rounds will cause small bits of lead to be shaved off during the firing uh, which will in turn turn into molten lead and find their way through the gas port in the barrel and into the back of the gas cylinder uh, where they're going to cool and accumulate. Um, so, But back to uh, using ammunition outside the standard pressures of 115 to 124 grain, uh, I need to make sure it's clear that exceeding that range will increase the slide velocity beyond the optimal range, uh, leading to what we call overfunction or too much recoil impulse. Uh, this increased rearward movement of the slide causes it to impact the receiver harder at full travel. Uh, when this happens, uh, the top round of the magazine will slide slightly forward along the feed lips of the magazine because there's less upward pressure on that round due to the slide being further to the rear and moving so rapidly. Uh, the issue is further compounded in the P7 pistols in the early P7 and M8 due to their magazine design. Those magazines have shorter, less encompassing feed lamp ramps, sorry, feed lips uh, than the later versions of the M8 magazines and all of the ones for the M10 and M13 magazines. In other words, earlier feed lips contribute to what is called nosing up. There's just not enough um, grip around the, uh, the chambered cartridge in those earlier magazines. So, when the uh, slide comes forward at that higher rate of speed, um, again, due to using ammunition outside the range of 115 to 124 grain standard pressure, uh, the feed pawl on the bottom of the slide will strike a uh, partially fed round, and that round then jumps out of the magazine rather than being properly positioned forward in the chamber in a controlled fashion. Um, what results is often the round sticking up and out of the ejection port, hence the term nosing up. So the problem's aggravated further when you uh, combine weak magazine springs um, and either deferred or improper maintenance of the gas piston and cylinder. Um, so if your magazine springs are weak, you'll normally see nosing up with the last two rounds of the magazine where the spring tension's the least. The solution, of course, covered in my maintenance recommendation video that you can watch on my channel is to simply swap out your old worn out magazines with new ones um, you can also prolong the life of your magazine springs by downloading them by one round. Uh, that's what I've been doing for years with my everyday carry P7M8 um, pistol. Now, how many of you with 30 to 40 year old P7 series pistols have ever replaced your magazine springs? Go ahead and raise your hands. <laughs> um, specifically, just think about all the owners of the German police trade-in pistols which were carried fully loaded for decades. Um, those magazine springs were almost assuredly in need of replacement, and I see this often with, uh, with customers who send me their pistols in for, uh, for maintenance. So a quick look at this photo from a recent customer's P7 um, will help you illustrate this issue. He was complaining of the pistol not locking back and nosing up on one of his two magazines. Um, and as you will see, um, one of the magazine springs is out of sp spec from being compressed too long and too many times over the years to the point that it's no longer the right length anymore. Um, and that's the reason that it's no longer cycling necessary to keep up with the speed of the slide as it's cycling. So let's talk about now re refinishing because I get this question a lot too. If you make the decision to, to uh, give your tired old P7 series pistol a refinish, I recommend you stop, take a deep breath, and do your research. Um, please do not send it to the guy you know who does seracoding of Glocks out of his garage down the street. Um, I've lost track of the projects. Um, 
that have come across my work been specifically fouled up from these type of uh, refinishing jobs. Um, and there are a few issues that come into play here. Uh, first, the tolerance between the internal components is already incredibly tight in these P7 series pistols, much greater than you'll see in other pr uh, production pistols of, uh, of the current uh, state. Uh, using a refinish that has a thick cons consistency is going to negatively affect that tolerance and can bind up the operation um, of those internal components. And if it does work, it'll most likely wear unevenly in those areas where the tolerance is too tight and, uh, and just turn out looking really crappy very quickly. Um, then there's the problem of dealing with the barrel and gas cylinder. Um, as those are not going to be removed um, during the process, um, the, these people just don't have the, uh, the tools and the, and the experience to do that correctly. Um, and... Uh, and I've seen several companies that will do refinishing where they um, do it by a, a bathing process. And if you're going to dunk the whole gun um, in, in a bath, well, it's really hard to seal off the barrel and the, uh, the gas cylinder uh, properly to do that. Um, next, due to the uh, unusualness and complexity of the P7 series, you know, that guy who looks at it and says, well, this doesn't look like a Glock. Um, quite often damage is done to the internal components while attempting to uh, conduct disassembly or reassembly of the pistols um, and they just can't get them uh, reassembled and uh, and you wouldn't believe it if I didn't show you pictures but um, you know I've actually had people send me pistols that have been refinished that don't work and when I take them apart you can see where the person who was doing the refinishing clearly didn't know how to take it apart, so he just sprayed over all of the assembled parts. And when you would move the parts, like the magazine release or the cocking lever, you would see all of the unfinished areas underneath. It, it just a disaster. So make sure you, you choose um, the right person. Um, just incredible. There are some uh, places out there that still do excellent work. Um, but even some of them will be resistant to do um, that unless you send them the pistol already completely disassembled and then they want to send it back to you unassembled. So you've got to figure out how to take it apart and put it back together again yourself. Um, so I've been helping customers do this for years. Um, and often what I'll do is I'll conduct the, the full disassembly cleaning and inspection of the pistol and then send it out to their refinisher of choice and then make sure that it comes back and it's done correctly um, before I reassemble it and send it back out to the customer. And, uh, and this, is, um, this has become very important too because I've had some reputable companies who have uh, sent me back guns where uh, we've had some significant problems, including uh, um, uh, this barrel that was completely rusted out um, when I received it back. And I had to fight with that company for them to... Uh, to basically admit that it was their fault, and then we had to uh, to figure out how to source a new barrel and get a new barrel replaced in there um, before sending it back to the customer. And I was able to do all that without you know the customer even getting involved with it. So um, it, it's a nice touch. Bottom line, um, make sure you you pick a good refinisher. And if you got questions on P7 series specifically, again, give me a shout. I'll be happy to share what I what I know about it. Now let's talk about cleaning and maintenance. Uh, this is the single biggest problem I see with the P7 series pistols uh, that come across my workbench, and that's uh, deferred and improper maintenance. And this occurs for several reasons. Uh, first, uh, I think generally people just don't enjoy cleaning weapons. Uh, I'm clearly a strange individual, and I, I find it therapeutic and uh, almost as much fun uh, getting the weapons dirty as I do cleaning them up. Um, but hey, that's just me. Uh, second, uh, I think most people never read their owner's manual that came with each pistol, uh, specifically the maintenance section, where they've lost or never received the manual along the way. Um, so if you need help getting that information, give me a shout, I can help you with that as well. Uh, and lastly, because the weapon's so unique and different from other handguns that they own or have experience with, they simply don't know how to properly maintain them. Um, add to this, um, often they, they don't have the two cleaning tools 
that um, are originally shipped with the weapon and were intended for use uh, during each maintenance cycle. And those parts are the gas cylinder scraper tool and the, uh, and the cleaning brush. So these came in all the boxes. You're supposed to have them. If you don't have them, you need to go online and find them uh, and have them in there. They're, they're crucial to the operation. Okay, obviously the first piece of this is um, the scraper tool. Um, it's designed to fit inside the actual gas cylinder. And then as the name suggests, you turn it and scrape all of the carbon buildup that's inside that gas cylinder and then remove it out. And then that's followed up with your uh, brass brush, which again goes in there, pulls out all the rest of that and yanks it out. And then what I'll do is I'll follow that up with a long handled Q-tip like we see here and get inside that gas cylinder as well. That single issue causes the most problems with the weapon um, either becoming sluggish or the slide locking back to the rear, just not maintaining the gas cylinder um, itself with the proper tools. Okay. Um, sometimes I see owners who try to get around um, the issue of uh, cleaning internally in these parts because it's very hard. Um, you know, you just can't get compressed air inside here or a Q-tip into these areas and, and, uh, and get them properly. So they'll overcompensate by just lubricating everything heavily with whatever their solvent is of choice. And the challenge there is it either is going to be dripping off with solvent um, and just make a, a muddy mess, or that product is going to coagulate over time, and that's going to lead to the weapon seizing up in crucial areas um, from too much application of that. Um, lastly, I quite often see a buildup of carbon inside um, the pistol on on the uh, gas piston itself, okay? And the problem will come from people that are using products that are too aggressive on the gas piston uh, for cleaning, okay? So for general maintenance, you need to make sure that the weapon is as free as carbon um, and gunk buildup and surface rust. You can do that by, you know, just simply removing the grips of the pistol um, so that you can get a, a better access uh, to the inside of the receiver. Uh, for me, before spraying a bunch of lubricant uh, into the weapon and immediately uh, turning it into a big muddy mess, I'll just use a paper towel or a cloth and wipe down as much of it as possible uh, to remove that, uh, that stuff off. Um, then I can use an all-purpose brush um, to agitate those areas uh, if they needed, and if they have to uh, be hit in harder, more compacted areas, I've got a dental pick and I can really agitate those areas out. Um, once the majority of the gunk is broken and lifted away, that's when I'll apply a solvent um, to those metal surfaces. Uh, I've got another video on maintenance recommendations that I recommend, um, but I have to state this here, and please listen carefully, carefully and closely. Do not Put your P7 series pistol in an ultrasonic cleaner or solvent tank. Watch the video if you want all the reasons why. That's a horrible thing to do. Um, but if you are that lazy in cleaning, please, I beg you, just send me the P7 and let me take care of it properly for you. You put it in one of those um, tanks, you're just going to ruin your gun. Okay. Uh, for the barrel, you'll want to use a 9mm bore brush um, and insert it from the chamber. Uh, through to the crown of the barrel. Uh, once it's gone through, make sure you remove the end before you pull it back through. Never go backwards with your brush against the uh, direction that the bullets are supposed to uh, flow. You can cause damage to the barrel internally by doing that as well as the crown of the barrel. Okay, and then follow that through with a patch and solvent. Uh, some people will tell you to, uh, to finish that off with a clean patch until the barrel is completely dry. But depending on your environment and the stored conditions, you may want to leave a light coat of uh, solvent inside the barrel. Uh, if you see a buildup of uh, around the extractor cutout, 
uh, or in the flutes uh, or on the feed rip ramp. You know, all these areas in here, you can just get in there with a dental pick and, uh, and really agitate out those areas and clean them up and then follow them back through with some, with some solvent. Okay. Next thing you're gonna to wanna to do is make sure you remove the firing pin uh, assembly from the, uh, from the rear of the pistol. And you do this by, you've got a P7M series pistol. You squeeze the cocking lever back until the um, uh, firing pin is, is flush with the back of the bushing. And then you push in and rotate to the three o'clock position and squeeze the cocking lever all the way into that point and your firing pin assembly will come out the rear, okay? Now you can properly clean um, your firing pin assembly, remove any kind of uh, gunk buildup, carbon, um, any rust, and then you get inside here with a dental pick and, and with, uh, with long Q-tips um, to, uh, to make sure you clean that area out once you've disassembled your slide. Um, what you really want to focus on, obviously, is, is the carbon buildup and the rust. And... Uh, what I've seen most notably on these guns is rust. And what I believe has happened is that owners who carry these inside a holster in a vertical position and they're outside, exposed to the elements, they're training, or they're carrying on the range, and it starts to rain, that water will go straight down this opening in the rear and it'll collect inside that chamber um, and start to, uh, start to rust up. So make sure you you pull your gas, uh, I'm sorry, your firing pin assembly out every time and clean in there as well. Relubricate as necessary inside the, uh, the firing pin uh, channel. Uh, lastly, and most importantly for maintenance is the gas piston and cylinder. Um, the tolerances between uh, the gas piston itself and the cylinder are very, very precise. Um, if these piston rings are worn down due to improper maintenance, uh, then too much gas is going to pass over them, causing overfunction and no delay at all in the system. Um, and if too much carbon builds up between the, the gas piston rings uh, or on the cylinder itself, then the slide's going to seize up, as I mentioned earlier. So here's what I'd recommend. Uh, first, you've got to have those, uh, those two tools we talked about, the scraper tool and the brush. And... Uh, and we've talked about how we're going to uh, use those in the system. Uh, the next thing you need to do is make sure that you focus on the gas piston itself. And the, the problem I see is, is people being too aggressive. And what I think they do is they actually use this brush and they try and use this to clean all the carbon off. And what, they, what they're doing while they're getting the carbon in between these rings is they're actually wearing down the rings themselves. So you don't want to use anything that's abrasive on these rings because you don't want to decrease that. So do not use anything other than a soft bristle brush on these things. No stainless or brass um, brushes on them at, at all, okay? So what I recommend, what I do is, uh, is, is in my range bag, when I go to the range, I carry um, a little cleaning kit. And as soon as I'm done with, with, uh, with shooting my P7 series pistols, I take the slide off <clears throat> right there on the range while it's still hot, and I take a large patch and I'll just soak it down with solvent, okay? Then I take that patch and I wrap it around the gas piston, and then I secure it with a rubber band. And I throw it in the bag. And then when I get home, whether that's an hour later, that night, the next day, whatever it comes to with cleaning, by the time I'm ready to take action on the gas piston, all that solvent's already done its job breaking down all that carbon, and now I can come in there and clean it off really easy. Um, whereas if you just let it cake on there, now you've got the problem of a real buildup. And again, it's, we're not worried about um, the carbon that's in between the, the gas uh, piston rings as much as we are any carbon that would be on the rings itself, or if the carbon is, is so big that it's actually now outside the diameter of those rings. Okay, but hopefully that helps. Okay, and then finally, a light coat of lubrication across all the weapons. Remember, these are all steel construction. Uh, don't forget about your magazines. Uh, those can get dirty and gunked up too and lead to malfunctions and stoppages. And, and trust me, I've seen some guys who, it doesn't look like they've ever cleaned their magazines before. Um, so make sure you're taking those apart 
and cleaning those properly. Um, some guys will, will say, um, you know, keep your magazines completely dry, but again, it depends on your environment. You might want to have a little bit of lubrication on those. Um, one last point I'll share with you on the maintenance on the pistols uh, relates to the grip panels. Um, make sure that um, when you look at your grip panels, grab one that's already off, what you should see inside your grip panels is a little uh, tooth washer in there. They're pressed in there, but over time they can come loose and they'll pop out when you, uh, when you take your grip screws off. If you don't already have those in here, you need to get another uh, replacement set. Um, because if you don't, what you'll have a problem with is you're either gonna tighten your grip, your screws down so tight that you'll end up cracking your grip, uh, your grip panels. Or um, without the washer, once you're shooting and that repetitive recoil impulse happens, you're gonna actually have your screws walk themselves out and you're gonna lose them while you're out there on the range one day. So make sure that um, you either get those and if you can't find them to source the original ones, just go to your hardware store and get a little rubber um, washer about the same size and try that out and uh, you'll be surprised how well that works for you. Okay, so now that we've com completed our maintenance on our P7 series pistol, um, don't just throw it in your safe. Um, or back in your holster, be sure to conduct a proper function check to make sure that everything's been reassembled properly and it's functioning the way it should. Okay, so let's talk about what a function check should look like for a um, P7 series pistol. Okay, the first thing we're going to want to do, use my M8 here as an example. Okay. So if I had a magazine in there, I'm going to release the magazine. I'm going to pull the slide to the rear to make sure that I'm, I'm checking that it's unloaded. Okay, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to pull the trigger, and it should not fire because I'm not depressing the, the squeeze cocker. And that's pretty obvious. If it does fire, something really crazy has gone wrong. Next, you're going to depress the cocking lever, noticing the firing pins um, protruding out the rear of the slide, and you're going to pull the trigger, and you're going to hold that trigger to the rear. Obviously, the firing pin should fall forward. With the trigger still pulled back to the rear and the cocking lever still depressed, I'm going to cycle the slide to the rear and let it go forward again to simulate recoil. Now I'm going to release the trigger and it should reset, which it did. Okay. Then I'm going to release the cocking lever. I'm going to insert a magazine and I'm going to pull the slide to the rear. Okay. The slide should lock back on that empty magazine. Then um, I'm going to uh, re uh, release the magazine to make sure that it falls freely. Then I'm gonna depress the cocking lever to make sure that slide release action works correctly. And now I'm ready to go with a proper function check. Now let's go over my thoughts from an operator instructor perspective. Um, personally, um, for pros, I think that the P7 series is the best handgun design ever in a concealed carry pistol. Um, it's been created with innovative concepts, using highly skilled labor, the best quality materials, uh, during a period of crew craftsmanship of, uh, of Heckler & Cope. It's, uh, it's been my personal choice for concealed carry for over 23 years now, and I don't see that changing over the next 23. Um, so if you see me on the street, or instructing a class, you're most likely gonna see uh, a P7 series pistol strapped to my waist. I'm sure I consider myself a student of the gun and, and I like to remain proficient with all sorts of pistols, even ones from companies other than H&K. Um, but I always come back to the P7 series because for me, nothing else serves this role better and I certainly shoot it um, more effectively than anything else. So with that uh, being completely biased, <laughs> Let me cover a few more items uh, to put in the pro category. Um, for size, um, especially in single stack variants, it's about the perfect size uh, for a concealed carry. Um, for height, length, width, um, it just carries very, very well without being bulky, especially in a inside the waistband type capacity. Um, so as you can see, if I place it here, Next to my uh, P2000 SK, you'll see that 
the P7 M8 is, let me get this angles better, is just slightly longer. I mean, we're talking like a quarter of an inch longer. And in grip size with the, you know, little extended four plate there, it's about the same size in height, um, though the, the uh, trigger guard is lower on this. I can get my whole hand around it where I can't do that with the P2000SK. I'm kind of hanging off the back and it's significantly more narrow on there. So, you know, um, I don't see a, a real advantage to, you know, some of the SK models over just a standard uh, P7 or P7M8 um, for weight. Uh, though, you know, due to its all steel construction, it, it's slightly heavier than the more recent plastic Fantastics out there. Uh, but that weight translates to less felt recoil and less muzzle rise when shooting, uh, making it far more stable and controllable pistol. Um, and with a quality belt and holster, you really won't notice the weight difference um, over some of the lighter guns. Uh, the fixed barrel, the low bore access we've talked about, the gas retarded delay system, the optimal grip angle, uh, the consistent single action trigger like pull, they all combine to make the P7 series one of the smoothest shooting and accurate pistols ever developed. Um, it's just, it's just beautiful. Um, you know, sure now uh, we find uh, a consistent single action like trigger in a wide range of striker fired pistols these days, including the VP um, nine from H and K. Um, but what is really cool about the P7 series, unlike those other models that use a half-cocked uh, striker system um, with a you know, Glock-like trigger safety that you know, is pretty easy to defeat. Uh, you just don't have that problem uh, with the P7 series where uh, the striker is completely at rest until the cocking lever is, is depressed. Um, that multifunction nature of the cocking lever not only ensures that the weapon is completely safe for carrying any position on my bottle, body, uh, especially uh, appendix, um, but serving as a slide release as well uh, literally eliminates that additional step of releasing the slide separately when I bring the weapon back into action, making me faster and more efficient. Um, so I see that as another real positive for you. Um, but on to cons, uh, heat. I mean, without question, the pistol heats up quickly during training. It happens. There's no way around it. You just got to deal with it. Um, but again, remember, it wasn't designed to run hundreds of rounds through it in rapid succession. It was designed to be the fastest and most accurate pistol to bring into a gunfight. Um, and studies have repeatedly shown throughout history that those gunfights don't involve hundreds of rounds being fired in rapid succession. So how do I manage the heat? Well, uh, when training, I rotate drills between uh, weapons. Um, so if I'm shooting a P7 series for a bit, I'll transition to another pistol uh, or a subgun or a carbine or a shotgun. In the meantime, the P7 is cooling off. Um, sometimes I'll even take the slide off and lay the slide out separately to, you know, rapid, uh, rapid uh, cooling of the pistol. Um, another con is the unusual manual of arms. Um, some people just look at a P7 series and think of it as odd. Uh, they can't open their mind to something other than a Browning style of action uh, so the two minutes they spend fondling one of these in a gun shop just leaves them feeling uncomfortable. Um, so sure, there's a learning curve associated with these pistols, um, but with an open mind and, and understanding the history that led to the design and a solid mentor or instructor to help you appreciate the potential of the weapons, um, I found that Zen is usually achieved. Um, and I do that quite often when I'm teaching a training course and introducing people to these pistols and just watching their eyes light up is, is a special moment. Um, there's the loud cocking and uncocking of the pistol, and I've heard some people um, complain about that and say, you know, you're going to get killed in a gunfight um, with that much noise. I, I don't know. I just, I've never seen that to be uh, a real concern. Um, another uh, con I've heard um, that I think is actually pretty legitimate in this day and age is the fact that um, the P7 series has no way of mounting a light. Um, and as we know, lights are incredibly essential when you're carrying a handgun for self-defense. Um, over the years, I've seen several attempts made 
to mount lights. Um, I've seen one specific P7 owner who had a Picatinny rail uh, custom mounted to the forward of the trigger guard and he ran a light on it. Uh, it showed some potential, um, but if you can find someone to do that properly and don't mind altering your pistol, then you know maybe that'll be an option for you. Um, but due to the larger trigger guard area, the M-series pistols, there's just not a lot of real estate to work with. Um, and most people just don't want to mess up their, their really expensive P7 pistols with, with a custom mod like that. Um, Surefire offered a light for the P7, M8, and M13 at one point. Um, but as you can see here, it was incredibly long and unwieldy. Um, and with an incandescent bulb, it was not very powerful. But, you know, at the time, we thought we were, we were pretty cool with that kind of stuff. Um, and although I can't find it right now in photos, um, I had a time um, that I remember many years ago in a CQB training course where there was a light actually attached to the base plate on the P7M13s with one specific team. And of course, my question to them was, what do you, ha what do, you do when you reload and you, you lose the magazine that's got your light? Um, so, you know, clearly there's an ideal solution um, but it was, it, it, it was better than nothing at all. Um, so my personal solution is, you know, I, what I do with every gun is, is I carry, you know, a handheld light. Um, everywhere I go, I've always got a light. Even if I'm carrying a weapon that has a weapon-mounted light, I'm always carrying a secondary light for those reasons. And I just get proficient with running a light, you know, with, with my weapon. Um, and you can do those same kind of things. Um, so... I can work around those issues as well. It's not that huge of a con for me. Uh, but without question, uh, I think the two biggest remaining cons against the P7 series are price and availability and parts, service, and uh, uh, support. So you've got price and availability and parts and service support. So let's start with the last point, lack of service support. Yes, H&K no longer provides warranty service and uh, repair support for the P7 line, um, this is in keeping with what they've done on all their other legacy weapons that preceded it. You'll see similar practices with other firearms manufacturers as well as other companies um, that want to continue to be relevant. Uh, they're eventually going to stop supporting their problems, uh, their, their weapons or their products. So you just got to be aware of it um, and find another solution. Um, over the years, those H&K employees with skills and knowledge on those older weapons, they've retired and moved on to. So, you know, really don't get mad at H&K for this. They're focused on supporting their current production line and, and the weapons and future programs. Um, but all hope is not lost. Again, that's what I'm here for. Um, you know, I've been provi providing the service and support and training across the entire H&K product line for years uh, with specific focus on these legacy weapons like the P7 series. They continue to be the mainstay of what I see on my workbench every single day. Um, and several times a week, I'll receive a call or email from an owner who's contacted H&K regarding, uh, you know, their P7 or other legacy weapon, and they've been referred to me. So whether you're looking for repair overall or just want a P7 series pistol looked over by someone you can trust, again, give me a shout. That's what I'm here for. Um, I've got the tooling and parts, and, and clearly from this video, I've got the knowledge and experience you're looking for. Um, and most of all, I've got the passion for supporting the HK brand and the P7 fans. Um, and I personally find it humbling and extremely rewarding to return these weapons um, to service. Be that your Grail P7M13 you just picked up, the, the P7 your dad passed down to you, or the retired New Jersey State Trooper who thought that his options were completely out of luck um, to get his you know, former service pistol back in action. Um, now for parts availability. Um, yeah, there is no question this is a big concern. Uh, along with the decision to stop supporting the service, H&K also stopped making all the parts for the P7 series, and they've sold off the stocks, um, so uh, you can't call them up and get parts anymore. Um, when word got out that this was happening, um, almost everything that was on the open market was quickly bought up. Um, and, uh, you know, there are still some parts out there, but most of that's in Europe and uh, sourcing that becomes more and more challenging, expensive every day. Um, so, um, 
the parts supply I maintain, I keep on hand in order to continue to support the necessary repairs for customers instead of selling them for a quick buck. Um, but unless someone with a manufacturing capability steps up to produce replacement parts for these weapons, I foresee that it, it won't be long until, uh, due to their increasing values um, at collector levels and the fear of breaking a part that can't be replaced, a great many owners are going to relegate the P7 series pistols to safe queens and coffee table discussion pieces, and, and that's a shame. Not me, of course. I'm prepared to run all of mine until I'm dead and then pass them on to my kid, but... Um, you know, so he can do the same, but the reality really is upon us uh, with parts availability. And that leads us to price and availability of the pistols themselves. Um, since the pistols are no longer produced and the secret's out of what awesome items they are, finding one these days uh, at anything near a decent price is challenging at best and near impossible at worst. Um, even H&K fans with a modest collection will have at least one in their safe uh, while serious collectors are hoarding up the mint uh, and near mint examples whenever they come up for sale. Um, so prices on sites like Gunbroker will continue to climb to absurd levels, and uh, even for those with a pretty poor condition. So what are you to do? Uh, well, first I would say get all your money together so that you can act quickly when the right one does pop up and be patient until that time. Um, as I've mentioned previously, the German police trade-in models are great options for a, a baller on a budget. Um, and I mean, if, if you're really intent on carrying and using a you know, pistol every day like me, then the finish wear isn't going to really be a, a big concern to you. Um, you know, this is my personal EDC P7, and uh, you know, it's been refinished twice, and it's still got you know, a lot of shiny edges on it, um, but it runs like a top. Um, so uh, I'm not really concerned with what it looks like. It, it's form over function um, isn't really my policy. I'm, I'm, about, I'm about function, and it, it, it works like it should. Um, when you're looking for one, I highly recommend you take a, a more active role than you might with another gun. Uh, all too often, you're going to see you know, pistols for sale with just a left and right side profile photo, uh, and that's it. Uh, you know, and while this may allow you to see, you know, some minor finish wear on the, on the edges of the slide and grip from, from being carried, um, what you really need to see is the inter, internal condition of the weapon. Um, so if not available in the listing, I'd request detailed close-up photos or a video walkthrough that includes, uh, you know, the inside of the slide, you know, with specific focus on the gas piston area, and uh, you know, take the grips off and look at both sides here, and you're looking for any kind of you know, significant wear, damage, or, or really, really caked up gunk buildup. And, and again, my experience is most people just don't take the time to clean their weapons, and that, that can save you some time or push you off from something that, uh, that may cost you a whole lot of money uh, on the back end. Um, As mentioned previously, with an all-steel gun and tight-fitting parts, surface rust and carbon gunk buildup is more of the norm with these pistols. Uh, having to replace worn-out and out-of-spec parts like a gas piston can be expensive and challenging, uh, and they could be the leverage for you to get the pistol you're looking for at a lower price or, or just the smart move to walk away. Uh, on many occasions, I've uh, helped um, the buyers convince the seller to agree to have me inspect and service the pistol as part of the purchase which adds a huge level of confidence during the sale. Uh, quite often as well, I've been able to help broker sales for owners that wanted to make sure their P7 series pistols had received a seal of approval before being offered for sale and not wanting to deal with the selling the process themselves. Uh, of course, the buyers were also excited to know that their P7 just came off my workbench too. Uh, with that said, my final adv advice on purchasing one is like most things when it comes to buying guns, do your research, be patient, and then buy the the nice ex example that you can afford. And if you're one of those guys who once you finally get a P7 series pistol is too afraid to actually shoot it for fear of scratching it or lowering its value, then go ahead and buy yourself too. Uh, these truly are some of the most enjoyable firearms to own and shoot. So do yourself a favor and add one to your collection or at the very le least, find a friend that has one and take him out for uh, a trip to the range so he can take it for a test drive. Okay, well that wraps it up. Um, if you made it to the end, well then I commend you. 
uh, but my goal here was to make the most definitive review I could on uh, the P7 series, and I think we've accomplished that. Um, so, thanks for joining me. I hope that you've enjoyed the video. Uh, I know that even the most die-hard, see what I did there, P7 fan uh, has learned a ton. Um, if you uh, know of any other P7 fans or just HK Pistol fanatics, uh, please share the video with them. Uh, as always, I'm incredibly humbled to uh, share this knowledge and experience with you guys. And uh, if you're looking for uh, H&K service and support or you need training opportunities, give me a shout. That's what I'm here for. Take care, guys. See you next time.